Fiscalist Committee on Legislative Branch Spending for Fiscal Year 1995. The Rules Committee decides the guidelines on how debate is held in the House. Members are considering a $1.9 billion bill for overall congressional operations, including funding for the Library of Congress, General Accounting Office, and Government Printing Office. Chairing the committee is Democratic Representative Joseph Moakley of Massachusetts. This part of the program runs about two hours and 25 minutes. Rules Committee will come to order. <clears throat> There's been a request for a uh, filming of uh, portions of today's proceedings. Any objection? If not, we'll be done. Uh, today on the uh, the docket is H.R. 4454 from the Committee on Appropriations, the Legislative Branch Appropriations for Fiscal Year 1995. <clears throat> Today we take up that Legislative Branch Appropriations, and I would like to begin by observing that the bill before us today is the product of many, many hours of hard work, and the members of the staff uh, really deserve our appreciation. This bill funds the operations of not only the House of Representatives, but it also provides for the funding of other agencies, such as the Library of Congress, the Government Printing Office, and the General Accounting Office. <clears throat> the money in this bill is mostly for salaries for our staff and for the staff of these other government agencies. The amount in the bill represents the first increase in the legislative branch bill in, in the last four years. Even with the most very modest increase in this bill, it is not possible to fully fund many of the necessary capital improvement projects, nor is it even possible to fund mandatory increases that are required of us by law. The Appropriations Committee has made some very hard choices so that there is, an, there is the most bang for our buck in this legislation. H.R. 4454 provides the funding for our very lean legislative branch, which allows us to fulfill our constitutional obligations as we serve our constituents as well as we can. I would also like to th th take this opportunity to remind everyone that the legislative branch is a co-equal branch of government and must be treated as such. Trimming the cost of governing is necessary, but we cannot continue to cut and cut when these cuts are not in the best interest of the country. Traditionally, this bill has provided a wonderful opportunity for some to grandstand and to say this particular agency should be cut, or this account should be cut, uh, and it's merely an example of government waste. Most of these arguments are flimsy at best and only allow a slick soundbite and a nice addition to a campaign brochure. Well, there are many valid and worthwhile proposals with regard to this bill, and I believe that these should be debated on the floor. We must resist the kind of amendments that merely make for good television while doing irreparable harm to our branch of government. I would like to once again recognize the fine work that this bill represents and again make the point as forcefully as I can that the legislative branch has sustained continual cuts in his funding over the last 15 years. The executive branch, on the other hand, has grown at a rate nearly 40% greater than the legislative branch over the same period of time. This patent does not serve anyone well. The United States government is the most representative in all the world and certainly the most responsive to the needs of its citizens. This provides for the funds necessary to carry out the operations of the legislative branch and I think that it is absolutely vital to adequately fund these operations. At this point, I'd like to yield to my friend from New York, uh, the ranking minority member, Mr. Solomon, for an opening statement. Mr. Solomon. Well, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. And in welcoming our two um, members to testify before this committee, let me just uh, preface those remarks with uh, the fact that earlier today, this committee reported a restrictive rule on the Foreign Operations Appropriation Bill. 
making an order only eight amendments of the 39 that were filed before this committee. Now we're being asked to grant yet another restrictive rule on another appropriation bill, this one on the operations of the legislative branch. And Mr. Chairman, as I said before, I must strongly protest tying the hands of members of this House when it comes to exercising our most constitutional powers of the purse. And that is what the House of Representatives is. It is the only control we have on representing the people of this country over the executive branch. If we can't be trusted to legislate wisely for the good of this institution, for the good of our constituents, and for the good of this nation, then, as Admiral Stockdale said, then what are we doing here, really? Mr. Chairman, we are told that we are in the process of downsizing the Congress, just as we have required by law that the executive branch be downsized by some 270,000 employees. And yet our budget for the Congress this year is going up by 5.7% over last year. That sounds like uh, more inside the Beltway lingo to me, Mr. Chairman. Only here in Washington can we say we are downsizing while we're spending more. Mr. Chairman, the fact that the Democrat leadership doesn't trust its own membership, and I'll repeat that, the fact that the Democrat leadership does not trust its own membership to offer amendments in the House on a bill that appropriates money in this House is a sure sign that we are in dire need of reforming this institution. And the fact that we spend more money while claiming to be getting by with less is another indication that this institution is in drastic need of overhaul. Mr. Chairman and members, I hope that this committee will take these signs very seriously and report out the congressional reform package that has been languishing in this committee for months now. As a member of that joint committee, uh, which is co-chaired by my good friend and our member on this committee, David Dreyer, that worked all last year on ways to improve the institution of Congress, I further hope we will allow for a generous amendment process so that we can further strengthen this bill. Now, having said all that, I welcome our witnesses, and I especially hope that the distinguished chairman will request the open rule that has been so richly deserved by every member of this body. Every member of this body is equal, 435 of us. We deserve the right to say what we're going to spend money on ourselves for. So come on up, gentlemen. We welcome you. Well, actually, before we do, uh, the gentleman from New York knows very well that over the past eight to ten years, I guess, that there are two appropriation bills that have been coming with structured rules foreign aid because it has no constituency and everybody can be a hero by cutting out money to some foreign country regardless of the good it eventually does and on legislative appropriations where uh, people in the past have shown utter disregard for common sense and uh, are just playing to the uh, the press and the tabloids uh, and I, I think we just have to exercise responsibility as you well know 11 of the 13 appropriation bills are wide open and, and they can do almost anything uh, they want and, and we'll continue that way but it just happens that the first two out of the three that uh, we're here, it just happened to be uh, uh, closed rules. Well, Mr. Chairman, uh, re reclaiming my time, and uh, uh, I appreciate uh, what the gentleman is saying, but uh, the truth of the matter is that uh, we just are not making any serious effort at trying to reduce this, this sea of red ink that is just drowning this country, and is, it's ruining this country, and it's going to get much, much worse. And the truth of the matter is that the, the body itself is hamstrung. Uh, we had 40 members offer amendments on the last appropriation bill. It was a foreign operations bill. Very, very controversial issues. And yet there wasn't anything dilatory about any of those amendments. We could have taken that to the floor. We could have debated those amendments. And the House would have worked its will. We could do the same thing with this legislative branch. And uh, uh, I, for one, think uh, we have a pretty good budget. I think that the two gentlemen appearing before us in a few minutes, uh, Mr. Young of Florida and Mr. Fazio of California, I think have a tremendous obligation and responsibility, and they do an excellent job. But the fact still remains that every member of Congress, all of us, 435 members should have the, the opportunity to have our input into how we structure the spending on the Congress itself, and we're going to be denied that, and it just isn't fair. 
I'd be glad to yield to the, the co-chair of the, uh, the uh, committee to reform this Congress. I thank my friend for yielding, and I just uh, wanted to associate myself with his remarks and say that one of the, the things that has been extraordinarily frustrating for those of us who did serve on our committee to reform the Congress is that we were a committee that existed for one year, from January 1 of 1993 to December 31st of 1993. We assumed that by the fall of last year, we would have been able to report a major reform package to the floor that would have brought about reductions in staff, streamlined the committee process, uh, addressed issues like proxy voting and a wide range of other things. And tragically, and Mr. Chairman, you know, excuse me, but this seems to be the appropriate time as we prepare to address the legislative appropriations bill, talk about the fact that we have not been able to get that reform package that was reported out of our committee before Thanksgiving of last year to the floor as it was reported out. And I think that we should do that. Chairman Hamilton joins me in wanting to have a generous rule that would allow the 20 some odd amendments that were rejected on party line votes in the committee to be considered on the House floor. And unfortunately, as we prepare to address the legislative appropriations bill here, we have not done anything, anything at all other than hold some hearings that uh, uh, to, to deal with the whole issue of congressional reform, which frankly was one of the major planks of the platform of, uh, of almost all of the new members of Congress who uh, ran last year. And I thank my friend for yielding. I thank the gentleman. Uh, is the gentleman uh, from uh, California uh, will admit that uh, one of the amendments that uh, uh, some of the amendments on the foreign aid bill were not entertained because of this gentleman, Lee Hamilton, thought that they shouldn't be on the foreign aid approach, that they should be on another piece of legislation? Well, Mr. Chairman, I think that the reason for that was that uh, he saw it as legislating in an appropriations bill, which is what we were doing. As I read the letter that he sent to us on the foreign ops bill, that's what it had to do with. And that really doesn't have anything to do with, with, uh, with the desire that Lee and I have to move a bill to the floor which is charged with reforming the whole institution. But well, you Jim, probably know that, uh, that uh, Mr. Hamilton has been up uh, uh, talking some of the members and he's still uh, uh, unsure on which uh, way the bill should come to the floor that he's still examining it so actually he hasn't decided uh, which way he would like to see the bill come to the floor well I had a conversation with him yesterday mr. chairman and in that conversation he made it very clear to me that he still wants to have a generous rule that would allow the ideas that that we had uh, uh, debated in our joint committee last fall come to the floor. So there's been no indication to me whatsoever, based on a conversation I had with him less than 24 hours ago, that he uh, in any way wants to see this package separated or moved to the floor without the, um, without the full consideration as we discussed it in that committee. Well, the last, I, last conversation I had with him, that he was going to talk to other members of the committee, and then we're going to get back and sit down and just see what the consensus would be. Well, I guess I was one of those would, members uh, of the committee to whom he spoke. The gentleman would yield. yield. Uh, to yield I think it's, uh, it's ironic to point out, and we have some <coughs> members of the Foreign Affairs Committee sitting in the audience out here, and uh, I used to serve on that committee, but it's ironic, and it shows the frustration of this, uh, of this Congress that uh, we haven't had a foreign aid authorization bill since 1985, and that's why there are attempts to legislate in an appropriation bill. Uh, if the House were allowed to work its will with open rules, uh, we wouldn't have this problem, and, uh, and that's what congressional reform is all about. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Derek? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, this, uh, this bill, of course, is the, the, the number one bill to come through the Congress each year where there's an opportunity to cheap shot it. And, of course, that's why it's being televised this morning. That's why one of the few uh, <laughs> rules committee is being televised this morning. And we all understand this. And I appreciate the work the gentleman from California has done on, on the reform. And uh, I agree with him on, on many of the steps that they've taken and, and support that. But, you know, for many, many years, both Democrats and Republicans uh, have had a great old time damning this institution. <coughs> This is the greatest, in my opinion, representative body in the world. You can look at it in a vacuum, and you can find a lot of things wrong with it. But if you look at the alternatives, if this country did not have the Congress, would be anarchy where we would be shooting each other in the streets, or either we'd have a government who would be uh, shooting us. And I just, just, just hope that, that we'll remember that, you know, our old institutions are pretty strong, and the Congress is pretty strong, but we can weaken it to the point 
Well, one of these days, someone's going to come along, and because it has been weakened by this very rhetoric that we find so attractive back home and so attractive on television, has weakened it to the point that we may no longer have it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Does the gentleman yield? I'd be delighted to yield. Uh, you know, I, uh, I have great respect for Butler Derrick, who is going to retire from the Congress this year. All of that's not necessary. But, <laughs> what you got on your mind, sir? <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, well, you know, when you talk about cheap shots now, I'm looking at the list of uh, that we're going to be considering here, and we, we're going to have 43 members of Congress coming before this committee testifying on behalf of their amendments. I'm looking out in the audience now. We have Democrats and Republicans. We have my good friend from New York, Tom Matton, my good friend, uh, Democrat from Ohio, uh, Mr. Trafficant. You go right around the room. But as I look at these amendments, there is not one cheap shot amendment here. They are legitimate concerns by Democrats and Republicans. So it isn't a question of, uh, of uh, you know, cheap shots or uh, standing up to the television sets. Every one of these amendments ought to be allowed to be debated on the floor, and the House will have worked its will. We'd all vote for the bill. Now, it's a question of whether the bill's going to pass. Mr. Solomon, you know, no, uh, you know, you guys have been talking over here for the last half an hour. I think it's time for someone over here to have an opportunity to say something. I was just going to support the remarks that you made. Well, that's uh, all thank I was you. I do. appreciate that, but uh, be that as it may. Mr. Uh, Gillis, not, you, I'm, I'm sorry. Not, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not quite through. <laughs> they are cheap shots, Mr. Solomon, and maybe the amendments themselves are not cheap, but some of the very people who offer these amendments are the largest spenders in this Congress out of their personal accounts. And that is a cheap shot. Okay. Are you, Mr. Mr. Billingson, do you have an opening statement? No, I'm just waiting patiently to hear the bill before us. Uh, sure. Anybody else? Mr. Chairman, <coughs> Mr. I Pullen? don't have a lengthy statement, but I think it's time to get down to business. I agree with the gentleman. This, for the past 31 years, this has always been a bone of contention, legislative appropriation. And I think it'll be even greater today. So listening to Jerry and to the chairman and to Butler and to David, they have good points, but I'm anxious to hear from uh, Mr. Fazio and Mr. Young and see where we are. How many amendments are going to be made in order? If it's a closed rule, then I don't support it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Mr. Chairman. Before you do, may I Mr. thank you? Mr. Goss. Since I have two amendments on the list, uh, and I've now uh, been included with a group of members who are being called cheap shot artists, uh, I think it's... I thank, thank my good friend for excluding me from the list. As the other 42 members, I'll let you apologize to them one by one as well. Um, I want to make very clear that anybody who submits an amendment uh, to this legislation, in my view, has a right to do it for a very simple reason. If there is any piece of appropriation legislation that we need to justify as an institution to build confidence in this country, it is this bill that we take care of ourselves with. This is the bill that deserves the public debate more than any other on all of these amendments. If they are indeed causing irreparable harm to government, as the chairman suggests, any one of these amendments, that will be debated on the floor and the wisdom of the institution will prevail. I would suggest there is irreparable harm going to a great many individual taxpayers in this country, the people we work for, and that ought to be made manifestly available to them, that decision of balancing those interests out. My fear is we are going to shut out some good deserving amendments from debate. I don't know whether they'll fail or pass, but shutting those amendments out from debate because somebody's going to charge, oh, it is just a cheap shot or it is just a sound bite. Believe it or not, there are some members who do not even have opponents who are not concerned about the election. They're concerned about the well-being of the taxpayer in this country. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Wouldn't it be nice, Mr. Goss, if all the committees in the House followed the example of this committee where four years in a row we went in without any asking for Mr. Any Chairman, increase. I am proud to serve on this committee for that reason and the Ethics Committee, which had its budget mutilated last year. Are you people ready to face this <laughs> onslaught? <laughs> the Honorable Vic Fazio, Chairman of the Committee, will be accompanied by the Honorable Bill Young of Florida, who ranking minority member. Mr. Chairman.
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I appreciate the committee's attention. This is uh, H.R. 4454, the legislative branch bill. It represents one sixteenth of one percent of the federal budget. And I assume that the 42 or so amendments that have been requested are in rather stark contrast with the Milcon bill that was an open rule on the floor yesterday that had no amendments offered to it, even though it was several billion dollars in expenditures. I think that sort of draws the parallel for the public in terms of the degree to which this bill becomes the fixation of a lot of members, however minor it may be in terms of the total cost of government. It is one-third of our three equal branches of government. I'm here today with Mr. Young, who I have come to value greatly as a friend and colleague who has worked very closely with us on a bipartisan basis to put this bill together. I enjoyed, uh, for 13 of the 14 bills that I've carried to the floor, a very close relationship with Mr. Lewis. He, fortunately for him, found other employment on our committee. Uh, Mr. Young has taken, I think, probably one of the most uh, thankless tasks that can be provided, and he's done it in a way that uh, has earned my undying gratitude. This bill, as you all know, covers not only the operations of the House, the joint committees, the other joint items like CBO, OTA, CRS, and the GAO, but also the architect of the Capitol, the Library of Congress, and the GPO. We historically <coughs> take the Senate's funds when we go to the Senate, and frankly, uh, don't even meet and confer on the House items. They're determined essentially on the House floor. We confer on the joint items and technically on the Senate, which essentially we accept through comedy without amendment. This bill was reported out on the 19th of May. It represents uh, $1.88 billion in budget authority. That's $87.1 million under the amount requested by the agencies in the legislative branch. It is $45.6 million under the allocation made available to our subcommittee uh, through the 602B process. It is a very tight bill, and I will respond to one of Mr. Solomon's concerns in a minute, but let me say it is $101.7 million as we bring it here over last year. I fully anticipate that it will be a much smaller increase before it's voted on on the floor, because I know there will be a number of amendments made in order which will permit reductions. I hope those reductions are targeted and not across the board reductions. There's 56.4 million in this bill, which is an increase in mandatory items. And by that, I mean COLAs, the annualization of <coughs> the locality pay that was uh, provided last year, recurring longevity, merit, step increases, things that we do provide our employees here. Benefit costs, a much increased area of our bill, I might add, because now with the Federal Employees Retirement System, we pay the employer contribution, unlike the old Civil Service Retirement System, where it was paid out of the Treasury for all employees in all departments and agencies of the government. Uh, we also have some other items that are significant, um, for example, the uh, increasing bills owed to the government printing office. 17.1 million of this bill is for changes in the prices that we have to pay to acquire services. Postal rate increases, printing rate increases, the cost of book acquisitions at the library, utility rates we have to pay when they're passed on to us, increasing the cost of talking book machines for the books in the blind program. The balance of the increase, 32.8 million, is for much needed repairs, projects, um, not really capital outlay as much as the cost of maintaining the plant and equipment here. For example, 6.58 million to provide six new elevators in the Longworth building, something that many members have been urging us to do for a long time. Seven million dollars to begin the reconstruction of the Botanic Garden Conservatory. That's a $28 million expenditure over time. The existing structure was deemed unsafe and torn down. Uh, $4.65 million for a, a phased upgrade of the house telephone switch. Uh, $2.94 million for other house equipment purchases that are important 
to the maintenance of the plant. Uh, Two million for additional depository library documents, which are available to our constituents around the country. 3.2 million for various other physical plant projects. 4.3 million to continue the removal of asbestos at the GAO building. And another 3 million for the beginning and the rollout of a new ADP network for the GAO, a very important <coughs> agency in our scheme of government. They're also offsetting decreases, primarily a reduction in house mail volume, some program efficiencies at the Library of Congress, those total 4.6 million. There's some legislative provisions that are included here for the first time. I'll quickly touch on them. Um, there's a administrative provision that transfers the authority over the majority and minority printers to the director of non-legislative services. That comes from the majority and major the minority leaders who had nominal authority over uh, the public printers or those printers who were hired to serve the two parties. We added a grade 12 salary level to the current grade 11 authority for the nurses who serve this branch of government. Uh, we repealed the section that required that as we made our FTE reductions and we're midway through reducing the number of people in the legislative branch by 4%, uh, that we, because of the unique nature of the people we employ, we did not require the 10% of all the uh, reductions be made at GS 14 or above salary grade. Actually, the uh, GAO believes that in a survey of the FTE reductions that we have already made in our branch, we have more than met that 10% requirement, but in some particular agencies, it was working a unique burden. We also um, handled some balances for four employees who were transferred from the post office to the architect in terms of their benefits. And there's some other housekeeping provisions here that facilitate the operation of the house. I might say before concluding that it is a fair question to ask if we are reducing and we have by 5.6% the number of full-time equivalent employees in this branch of government. Why are we asking for increases? I think Mr. Solomon's question deserves a proper answer. And I think I would put it this way. 75% of our budget is to compensate people. About 15% in addition, by the way, goes to prevent these people from being inefficient by providing them with equipment computers, telephones, and other business equipment that, you know, normally would be found in a modern office. And some of our offices are not all that modern, but certainly those who wish to avail themselves of productivity increasing equipment can do so. That is 1.42 billion of the 1.88 billion in this bill. We needed an increase of 51 million over 1994 for salaries and benefits alone despite the reduction of 5.6% in the full-time equivalent. Last year's bill was underfunded in the sense that we didn't fund ECOLA and we didn't fund locality pay. Those, however, were in many cases provided. They were absorbed within existing funds. The 1995 budget presumes only a 1.6% COLA, not 2.6, and it presumes no locality pay. That is only $51 million. If we were to provide the 2.1 locality pay that some have asked for and may be provided, some <laughs> automatically receive it in our branch of government. About 80% of our people get it automatically. And if the 2.6 COLA is provided, and that's an issue that will come before the Congress and the Treasury Postal Bill, we'll need another $20 million on top of the $51 million in this bill just to pay our employees. So I, I think it is clear that we have a serious continuing problem if we're going to pay the people we employ at a reasonable rate. The Senate, by all objective analysis, is paying most of its key employees 40% or more than the House of Representatives. And certainly, we have to keep, I think, pace with people in the federal government who, in effect, are living in the same communities that 90% of our employees live in. 
So it is because of the 6% cost per employee that we normally would have to absorb before we begin to really consider this bill that we have an increase that I'm sure will be much less than 5.7% in budget authority before it is voted on tomorrow on the floor. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I would conclude by simply uh, requesting a rule that will waive points of order against uh, those provisions that, were, that, that I've mentioned that are based on Clause 2 of Rule 21 of the House. I ask that the rule provide for an orderly consideration of the measure. I'll be happy to discuss, after all the presentations, to follow uh, what might be a good range of amendments that would give the members an opportunity to deal with a whole cross-section of subjects that I know members want to deal with on the floor. I thank the chairman, the ranking member, and the other members for their attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to break in this uh, time. We have a, uh, a foreign aid rule that we're going to get to the floor, so we'll have some business. So we'll just break in at this time, and we'll just take a, a few minutes. Chair will be uh, in receipt of a motion. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, I move that the committee vacate its proceedings of earlier today, by which we ordered reported the rule providing for consideration of H.R. 44 like the foreign operations of Tokyo. Sure. There was an inadvertent error in that rule, and I have decided to You've heard the motion, General from Texas, Mr. Solomon. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, uh, there was a, uh, an error in the previous rule that we voted out earlier this morning. Uh, we, uh, we do not object to correcting that error, but we still have to vote no on the rule that we are uh, we're about to pass because it still has the restrictions uh, which do not allow uh, Republicans and Democrats to offer their amendments on the floor of the House. But we don't object to what you're doing here. It's simply to correct an error. Question comes up the motion, General. Texas, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. <coughs> the ayes have it. The rule is adopted. Uh, this was I mean, a motion to vacate. vacate. We go on the roll. Mr. Chairman, I have a new motion on the Foreign Operations Appropriations Bill. Mr. Chairman, I move the committee grant a rule providing one hour of general debate equally divided and controlled by the chairman and ranking minority member of the Appropriations Committee. All points of order are waived against the bill and against its consideration. The rule makes the pending question after general debate is completed. The adoption of the Appropriations Committee substitute now printed in the bill, debatable for 10 minutes, equally divided and controlled. All points of order are waived against the substitute and against the provisions of the bill as amended. If the committee substitute is adopted, it will be considered as the original bill for the purposes of amendment. The rule makes in order only those additional amendments printed in the report to accompany the rule to be considered in the order and manner specified in the report, with debate time also specified in the report. The amendments are not subject to amendment, except as specified, are considered as read, and are not subject to a demand for a division of the question. All points of order are waived against the amendments printed in the report. The chairman of the Committee of the Whole is permitted to postpone consideration of a request for a recorded vote on any amendment and to reduce to five minutes the time for voting against the first of a series of votes. Finally, the rule provides one motion to recommit with or without instructions. Move the motion, gentlemen, Texas. Mr. Sullivan. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, uh, again, I will point out that the rule now before us uh, corrects the error that was in the original rule that we, uh, we adopted earlier today. Uh, I would just point out again that uh, this rule that we're about to pass does restrict over 40 amendments that were cutting amendments that would have actually reduced specifically, as Mr. Fazio has mentioned, he, he hoped that uh, amendments would be specific and not across the board. We had offered uh, some 40 amendments um, that would have been specific in cutting foreign aid to certain countries uh, around the world. Uh, all of those amendments were voted down on a party line vote. I will not go through all that again, uh, asking for those 40 roll call votes, but we would uh, uh, just call that to your attention and we would vote no on the rule, on the floor. Question comes on the motion of Jeff Morton of Texas. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed no. No. Uh, the ayes appear to have it. The ayes have it. Mr. Hall of Ohio will carry the rule. And Mr. Dreyer will carry this new rule for the Republicans.
Well, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. And as I started to say before you uh, got into the new rule, uh, it was a very interesting uh, observation that Vic and I had an opportunity to observe here this morning as you went about the business of the Rules Committee. And all I can say is with your internal politics, I wish you the best of luck. And uh, have to say that a lot of things that were said here about this particular bill, I agree with. Mr. Derrick and yourself, Mr. Chairman, made some very good points on the importance of this institution and the fact that the nation would really be in sad shape if we did not have an independent elected legislative branch of government. And in order to have that branch of government, of course, we've got to have, we have to fund it uh, so that it, in fact it can function as a full one-third partner in this tremendous government of ours. And so I agree with that. Uh, I also agree with the uh, comment that may, once in a while there might be a cheap shot uh, taken at this bill or other bills. Uh, the advantage, though, in our system is that the, most of our colleagues are pretty smart. And if there's a cheap shot, they, they, they pretty soon recognize it for a cheap shot and are able to deal with it accordingly. But then I want to uh, go to uh, what Mr. Solomon said and Mr. Quillen, Mr. Goss, Mr. Dreyer, and, and add my own comments that I would prefer to have an open rule on this bill. I'd prefer to have an open rule on most bills. Because while I may agree or disagree, you disagree strongly with something that a member was offering as an amendment uh, and might do everything possible to, to defeat that amendment, uh, I still have the old-fashioned belief that uh, that every member of Congress is elected for a purpose, and each one has a similar uh, responsibility and authority as any other uh, when it comes to action on the floor. And I believe that uh, members should have the opportunity to, to offer amendments. Now, having said that, uh, probably you won't issue a, an open rule on this bill. Uh, that being the case, uh, there are a number of amendments that we'd like to see in order. Mr. Fazio and I have talked about the, the legislation at great length, and I want to say that it's a real pleasure to work with Mr. Fazio. Uh, last year was our first time to work together officially on this bill, uh, and uh, I was very new at it, and he was very good at it, and we, uh, I learned a lot from him. And this year, I hope I, maybe I taught him some things, but anyway, we, we make a pretty good team. And we don't agree on everything, but we, we recognize our responsibility to, to fund the legislative branch of government. Uh, there are some amendments that we believe ought to be offered, and we've provided you with a list of those amendments that hopefully you'll make in order. They should be offered because the House should make some decisions on some of those issues. Uh, we considered doing them in the subcommittee and in the full committee and decided that some of those issues really ought to be settled by the House uh, rather than the committee. And we will have our own personal recommendations when those amendments are offered. But we have given you a list of uh, seven amendments that we hope that you will definitely make in order. And you have the numbers of them, so I won't go into detail. Uh, I'm not satisfied that I'm going to support all of those amendments, but I think they're important for the House uh, to consider and make a decision. Uh, some of them, frankly, uh, should have been settled by the, House, the Committee on House Administration, uh, but they haven't been. Uh, so the, the House really should make those decisions. Uh, when, we, when we approach the amendments now, understand, as Mr. Fazio said, this is one-sixteenth of one percent of the overall federal budget uh, that we have control over. And if you, if you charted it on a graph, it wouldn't even be a blip in the line. It, it's that small. If you canceled the whole thing, uh, you wouldn't have done a whole lot uh, to affect the national debt or even the interest payment on the national debt. But that's not to say that we shouldn't get everything we can for the dollar. We need to squeeze it as tight as we can. We, we should be setting an example uh, for the rest of the agencies. And uh, hopefully that's what we'll do by the time we complete this bill. Hopefully we will have made some other adjustments. We will have brought it uh, so that it's not as much of an increase as it is today. And we uh, hope you'll give us the opportunity to offer these numerous amendments that have been requested of you uh, by uh, that Mr. Fazio and I have supported, but other, other members who have also offered some very, uh, very important amendments, some of which we might support, some of which we might not. Uh, Mr. Fazio may support some that I would oppose. Uh, I may support some that he would oppose, but that's, that's all part of the legislative process. And we're prepared to, uh, to have that kind of a discussion and a debate on the House uh, if you give us the opportunity to, to allow these amendments to be offered. Uh, one more point I would like to make. Uh, Mr. Fazio asked for protection for the language dealing with the uh, minority and majority printers. 
Uh, this was strongly supported in the subcommittee and the full committee. Uh, we hope you'll allow that uh, to be protected. Uh, it's just, just one of the many steps that we've taken to try to uh, bring in more revenue and eliminate some of the expenditures in an effort to, to bring this bill closer to uh, a very fiscally responsible piece of legislation. And I thank you very much and thank you. would respond to any questions that you might have or at least try to. Vic, uh, did you want to walk through those amendments? Uh, I think we might as well hear all the testimony from the members. And here. you're going to stay here until the end? I have to come back uh, at that point and, and you know, go through them with you. All right. Mr. Derrick? Uh, I have no questions other than to just thank you both for a lot of hard work and a, a, a very difficult work. Mr. Solomon. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, I'm sitting here and uh, sometimes I, I guess I do get a little exercised and uh, uh, my good friend Butler Derrick, and he is a good friend, but uh, sometimes he gets under your skin and uh, <laughs> I don't think he really, he really means to, but we'll you, sure, you, know, <laughs> you know, those of us, uh, <laughs> well, I wasn't going to say that, uh, those of us that served in the United States Marine Corps, and I see my friend Pat Roberts sitting over here. Uh, we live by a slogan, and that slogan is called Semper Fi. Right, Pat? Semper Fi means, what does it mean? Always faithful. And, you know, as long as I die, I will always be faithful to this institution. And when, when you hear statements like cheap shots, it really does get under your skin, because there are those of us that really have worked uh, hard to try to reform this house because we think we think reform is is desperately needed and it isn't just me or us that think that it's the liberal and republican think tanks like uh, like uh, the brookings institute norm ornstein tom mann it's the news media whether it's the wall street journal on the conservative side or it's the new york times or the washington post on the liberal side everybody says we ought to reform this house now, you know, you folks do a, a tremendously commendable job, and I'm not critical of you in any way. You have to come with a consensus, and you've done that in bringing this bill to the floor, and I admire you for it. You've done a great job with it. But there are those of us that really believe that one way to reform this House is to tighten the belts of the legislative branch. And in doing that, you know, we, there are two things, two reasons. One is that we, we really are just drowning in a sea of red ink, and we need to set that example where we can without hurting our performance. And we believe that that can be done, and a lot of that can be done with these amendments that are being offered. And the other is by tightening the belt, we can make those congressional reforms. There are those of us that believe, again, the liberal and the conservative think tanks, that we ought to reduce the size of these committees by one-third. And if we did that, if we shrunk those committees and those subcommittees, and we got rid of a lot of those fiefdoms out there, uh, that would automatically save millions of dollars in personnel on the committee staffs. And we could carry that further. Pat Roberts and others are going to be here testifying with all of the LSOs. Uh, we need to shrink the size of the, the uh, General Accounting Office, the Congressional Budget Office, the Library of Congress. If we're asking the executive branch to to shrink 270,000 employees, we've got to do it too. And and I'll yield in just a minute. It's um, that's hard to do because of all the pressures that we get because nobody wants to give up their subcommittee and their personal staff that they have on that subcommittee. But it's got to be done. You just look at the at the problem with illegal drugs in this country. We cannot deal with it in this Congress simply because there are over 57 subcommittees that have jurisdiction over almost all of this legislation. And consequently, year by year by year goes by and we do nothing about it. So there are those of us, Butler, that really are, are sincere and we're not out to cheap shot. We're, we're out to try to reform this house. And so we're going to try to do that. And let me yield to my good friend, Mr. Fazio, my classmate from 1978. I, I certainly had intended to hold most of my debate to the floor, and I will. But I want to reiterate, 5.6% reduction in full-time equivalent personnel is already been accomplished. We are on our way to doing more 
in the next fiscal year. I think uh, the materials that have been made available by DSG, which we will have more graphically displayed on the floor, go to the very point you're making. We are setting an example. Since 1979, there's been a 5% reduction in appropriations for committees and a 6.4% reduction in member staff in real terms. The, the price of representation, the cost of running the legislative branch has come down in real dollars, $8 since 1979. In terms of the number of uh, dollars spent in the judicial branch, up 165 since 1979. In the executive branch, up 29.3%. In the legislative branch, down 1.4 percent. So we're setting an example. We've set it, and we will continue to. The gentleman has made the points of why I commended both of you for the good work that you've done. And you know, there are 43 amendments filed with this committee. I'm going to vote against, if they were all made in order, I'm going to vote against 17 of those 43 because I think they are unreasonable. And maybe they do go, I don't think the authors are cheap shotting, but I think they're going too far. But. You made such a, such a good argument there. If we took all of these amendments to the floor, you'd win. You wouldn't win on all of them, but the House would have worked its will. And you're, you're very good at what you do. Uh, take it to the floor and let's let the chips fall where they may. Well, Mr. Solomon, yes. if, I, if you yield to me, uh, I think it's important, and I, that's why I think it, that an open rule is so essential, or at least grant the amendments that were requested by members. Uh, a lot of these amendments are going to very directly affect the members, uh, and they should have a, a, a something to say about the decision that they make. Uh, you can't make major reductions in this appropriations bill without having an effect on some members' offices. And I'll give you an example. Uh, there are two, uh, at least two of us, on the subcommittee, uh, who, in the, since we have been, been responsible for managing our own accounts. Uh, have returned unspent 35 to 40 percent uh, of our accounts, and I'm one of those two. Uh, we're prepared to, we were willing to go along with a freeze of, of staff, uh, but it would have had an adverse effect on a lot of other members who are at, at the maximum uh, level of staff, for example. But uh, it, it ought to be generally known by all the members that if we make major cuts here, that members are going to be affected, they should have an opportunity to be part of that decision and that's why I think it's essential that these amendments be permitted so that the House can make the decisions whether they want to affect themselves or not. And uh, if we don't give them a chance to vote, we're sort of insulating them from the real tough choices that uh, need to be made. And then <clears throat> just one last point that addressed to you, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Solomon. Uh, in the letter that I sent to the committee, I made a request, which I didn't repeat today, but I will now, that uh, in addition to the amendments, I would hope that you will grant me the opportunity <laughs> to offer a motion to recommit with instructions, either myself or someone that I would designate to do that. Well, I, I thank the gentleman. I'm not going to carry this any further. I just want to, again, uh, commend you. I, I want to point out and, uh, and pay credit to, to my chairman on the Rules Committee, because for the last four years, we have come to the uh, House administration and have not requested an increase at all in our budget. Now, what has that done? That means that our employees on this Rules Committee have not had an increase in salary for four years, and yet other committees have. And I hope that when you start considering this, this business of freezing, uh, that you take these things into consideration. Fair is fair. And under no circumstances should you be uh, freezing every member of Congress at his level. Bill, you said you turned back 30% of your, of your payroll. I turned back 20% of mine. And my people haven't gotten increases either on personal payroll. And if you freeze, it better be equal for everybody, or else all hell will break loose around here. I really do thank you for the good job you do. Thank you. Mr. Frost of Texas. Mr. Chairman, I, I have uh, just kind of a brief question uh, for Mr. Fazio. Um, I've been looking over all these amendments that have been submitted, and there's a very curious pattern here. And uh, I'd like to ask the chairman about this. Um, if I understand correctly, and uh, I've had discussions with, the, with uh, Mr. Fazio about this in the past, um, there are three categories that members actually uh, have allowances in. Uh, one, of course, is clerk hire. Uh, one is our official ex uh, expenses. And the other is in uh, franked mail. Now, if I understand what the committee has proposed, uh, the committee has proposed a $15 uh, million dollar increase in members' clerk hire over last year. 
it has proposed an increase in the expenses and allowances as compared with last year. Uh, I can't tell the exact figure, but I believe it's on the chart that the gentleman has mm -hmm. in front of him. I can't tell the exact figure from the committee report, but I do recall there is an, an increase in our official allowances. And the committee has proposed a $5 million cut in the franking allowance as compared with last year. So the committee has proposed an increase in two of the members' accounts, yeah. but a cut in, in the third member account. Uh, in fact, the uh, franking cut is, uh, is a 10 percent cut as compared with last year. And yet all the amendments that are pending before us only go to further cuts in franking, and I don't find any amendments on this list that cut members' clerk hire or cut members' official allowances, even though those are the items that have been increased. Uh, by the committee. It's a very curious pattern, and um, I think the committee has done a commendable job. Uh, I think a 10 percent cut in the, in the franc, while it will be difficult, uh, it's certainly something that uh, is a reasonable approach given the circumstances that we face. But then for us to be asked to make in order an additional cut below that figure while we're increasing clerk hire and increasing official allowances over last year doesn't make a great deal of sense to me. Well, I'd be happy to comment. I, I think the fact that uh, members are not attempting to cut clerk hire or official expenses sort of speaks for itself. Um, I, I don't think I need to add any more as to why the members would somehow submit 40-some amendments and not affect those accounts. It's a very curious pattern, is my yes, only it observation. Is. Yes, it is. And uh, I think it does come down to, I guess, the fact that the things closest to the members that they fully understand, they somehow feel strongly about holding sacrosanct. Uh, the franking uh, funding issue has been rather hard to get a handle on in recent years. Since in 1991, we began to allocate franking to each individual rather than to the House in general, we've had a widely varying pattern of expenditure. Uh, members seem to blow hot and cold on this subject, although I must say consistently public opinion polls show that public wants to hear more from their congressmen. I've seen a poll recently where 71 percent of those polled indicated they wanted to hear more from, <coughs> or at least uh, more than they had been. If the gentleman could yield so just there's at a that, great deal at, of interest. At, at in that Frank. point, uh, what we're talking about are sending uh, notices of town hall meetings so sure. that people can come to those meetings and sending newsletters and exactly. things of that nature. Exactly. Uh, that kind of mails, let alone the extensive responses required to the ever increasing amount of incoming mail that members are in receipt of. So I, I think that uh, the franking issue does get. Uh, a lot more attention. My sense is that the expenditure pattern has not really normalized, has not stabilized, but I think, uh, frankly, we will have an adequate amount uh, in 1995 as we have proposed. It always is cyclical in terms of uh, the first and second year of the cycle. And while there is a certain cynicism that the uh, second year of the cycle is always higher because an election year occurs. I would point out that most members in the first year of a new Congress don't mail as much, particularly in the first half of the year, because we haven't accomplished many of our goals. We don't have much to report. So <coughs> we tend to put more into the second year because that is the year in which we report on our accomplishments and on the Congress's actions. But I just want to be clear that you have proposed a 10 percent cut as compared with last year. Mm -hmm. And you have not opposed. You have not proposed comparable cuts in other accounts. Uh, no, uh, I think I think the action we've taken reflects the fact that there has been an increasing consumption of the authorized <coughs> amount by members, both for clerk hire and office expenses, and we've attempted to anticipate that in the appropriation for '95. If I could add, Mr. Chairman, there's one thing I believe is not generally known in the House, and that is uh, if you take the members. Uh, each member is given so many dollars available for clerk hire. Uh, we do not appropriate that total amount. We don't take that amount and multiply it by 435 members and five uh, delegates. Uh, we don't appropriate. What, what percentage of that amount do we appropriate? It's rather normally uh, five percent on average, less than the authorization. I mean, somewhere in that range. We we don't appropriate to the top level anyway. But uh, if you'd like to make that amendment in order, I'd be glad to offer it and uh, let the House make a decision on that. It, uh, you can add that to my list if you'd like. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I don't have a lengthy question or comment except to say that you do a Trojan job, both of you. 
and sometimes I don't think it's appreciated based on some of the amendments that people want to do I think uh, they are after some kind of glory but I don't question their sincerity and if they if it's debated on the floor of the house the membership usually makes the right decision because we can't operate without your funding the legislative branch or the executive branch we all know that so coming before us with a sensible bill is we should be patting you on the back and I know that that's the situation as I see it on the other hand I support open rule and the belief that the judgment of the membership usually prevails That's all, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Gordon. Mr. Gordon, Tennessee. I just want to concur with my friend and colleagues in Tennessee, Mr. Quillen, about hard work, uh, anxiety, and uh, all the difficulties in putting this uh, bill together. Um, but I would like to get some facts straight. I think Mr. Young earlier mentioned that this legislative branch bill only amounted to 1 16th of 1% of the entire budget. Is that correct? Uh, that was the figure that Mr. Okay. Speaker gave. I call it a flip in the line. Okay, so it was one, it's one sixteenth of one percent of the entire uh, budget. Now I assume that a, a great deal of that goes to the Library of Congress, to the maintenance of the Capitol, other things that the tourists and the, and, and the public and maintenance of our national monuments and heritage uh, require. Uh, but now even though General Accounting Office, which is General Accounting Office, okay. But even though this is just one sixteenth of one percent of the entire budget, it still has to fit in with the overall budget goals. And and uh, now is it correct? It's my understanding that the but the budget deficit for the last three years has gone down. Is that correct, Mr. Fazio? I believe uh, yes, in general. And someone was telling me that was the first time since Harry Truman was president that we've had three straight years yeah. of reduction in the budget deficit? Actually, I think our deficit now as a percentage of our economy is at the level it was in 1978, first time we've gotten back to that level. Yeah. Actually, the discretionary spending the Appropriations Committee handles is currently at the level that we last were at in 1948 when President Truman was in the White House. So even though there's been this steady reduction and you're only one sixteenth of one percent, you still fall within this category of bringing down the, the, the entire um, deficit. Yeah, I, I think, as I said earlier to Mr. Solomon, we have led the way, but our uh, ability to lead in any significant way is limited by the very small yeah. amount in our bill. Now let me ask also, um, the, uh, the executive branch is reducing the employment there in the White House and, 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 the, and government in general. Are the number of employees full time? Is that going down here in the legislative branch too? Is that that that's that 5.6 percent figure? We have actually reduced the number of our employees, and it's best expressed by the term full time equivalent employee. Uh, that means uh, we have two part time people adding up to one. We don't count two people; we count one. We actually have reduced the number of people working in this branch by 5.6 percent. Now we did that in part because we were granted the authority to provide early retirement incentives a year earlier than uh, the Congress provided the executive branch and the remainder <coughs> of the legislative branch. Three agencies, the GPO, the GAO, and the Library of Congress have, uh, I think in total, had uh, something 1,100 or so people retire uh, and, and leave government, and they were not permitted to replace those people. So. Uh, we have a permanent savings. So there's been a reduction in the number of employees. That's correct. And in, 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 this, <coughs> excuse me, in this legislation and the report, uh, we also recommend that uh, we, we direct the uh, Director of Legislative Affairs to do a study based on contracting out of several agencies, uh, for example, the folding room, yeah. uh, to determine if there are some savings that can be obtained there. So we're looking for more ways to, to save yeah. not only FTEs, but to save dollars. Well, I think it's important that there is a reduction in employment. I'm glad that you've done that. I'm glad that, that there is more of that in, in coming along. Um, there's been some discussion about mail. I'm just trying to get some of these facts straight. Um, uh, has, has the cost of, of mail gone up or down in the last few years? What's happened with that? Well, actually, since 1991, as a result of the reforms that Mr. Frenzel and I co-sponsored, we have saved almost $300 million in anticipated postage. 
and that is by restricting the amount available to each member and to frankly avoiding what was occurring so often in the 80s that some members were mass mailing massive amounts and we were all billed for it. So by simply making each member accountable for their own behavior, reporting quarterly and allocating to each individual office, we have saved in the aggregate almost $300 million. Now, now, does that take into account that the price of postage has gone up during this period of time? That, that includes the fact that we've had to pay more in postage to maintain our mail going out. So, so even though the price of postage has gone up during this period of time, there's still been savings within, within the well, mail? certainly, I think the savings are very real. The cost of postage, obviously, is an additional cost that we have to absorb. Um, I guess now finally, uh, let me ask you, well, let me also, ab about what is the cost per uh, individual in this country for the legislative branch? Well, we now are at about $5.95 per resident of the country. I think we were about a dollar more, as I said earlier, in 1979. So, so the, the, cost per, the cost per person in this country is going down for the legislative branch so That is not the cost of Congress, which would be significantly less than that, but the cost of the entire branch, yes. Oh, and, the, and so that, that $5.91 would include, again, the Library of Congress, every, every element maintenance of the different monuments, branch, yes. you know, that go, that, that's under the control, okay. That's right. Uh, I guess the last question I have is, during this, the process that you go forward to bring this to us, uh, did all the members have an opportunity to come to you at subcommittee and committee with amendments? So, uh, so I mean, is I anybody being shut out of this? Without anybody any question, chance? members could come to any member of our subcommittee and any of those amendments could have been made in order in the subcommittee markup or in full committee. The only time I have heard from any of the people who will be appearing here about specific amendments is subsequent to the bill being reported out of full committee. So any member had the open opportunity to come before this, both the subcommittee and the committee with amendments if they had an interest in uh, making any changes. Is that correct? That's, uh, I, I would hope I did not err in any specific example. I don't believe that uh, I have, and so I would say yes. They but, have. I mean, they, they had the opportunity. <coughs> yes, they did. They all I, had the, uh, I'm trying to remember if they did is another, to earlier. Is I don't another believe, matter. I don't believe anyone did, so I can conclude the same way you have, that people have had an opportunity. Well, they did or not, but they could both at the Mr. sub... Mr. Thomas may have brought me something. Mr. Young, yeah, Mr. Young would have to respond, too. But whether they did or not is the point I'm trying to make is, did they have the opportunity both at the subcommittee level and at, and at the committee level to bring forward amendments? In my view, uh, everyone who would want to offer an amendment has had the opportunity to do that. I think it's a lot more fun to have these amendments debated on the floor than to have them debated in a markup, even though it's open to the public and has always been since I've been chairman, and certainly more fun than having it taken up in full committee. It's uh, not as likely to gain public notoriety as it will be, obviously, when it's testified upon here and on the floor where there are cameras present. But all these people that filed amendments had the opportunity to bring them in an open way uh, before the, you know, twice. Without any questions. Okay. Uh, <coughs> if you, if you, you would, let, let me add to what Mr. Fazio said. Uh, <coughs> and he's exactly right that during the committee process that any member could have, uh, could have attended the meetings or could have, uh, through the chairman or myself or other members, could have offered amendments. But in defense of those who didn't do that, uh, and some did, and some of those amendments we're asking that you make in order now, we thought they would be better debated on the floor than in the committee. But in defense of the, amendment, uh, the, the offerers of amendments who didn't do that, uh, oftentimes they're not sure. A member finds it difficult to know what kind of an amendment he or she would like to offer <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> until they see what the product is. Uh, you know, you, you look at a bill today and say, gee, I, I'd like to make this change, but until you see that bill, you don't know what kind of an amendment you would like to offer. So I think that there is a defense for members not coming to the committee with their amendments uh, and, and waiting until after they see the final product before they decide what they'd like to offer. Well, do, do and I agree with that, but I also think it's fair to say that many of these amendments, I don't want to say have, well, let me put it this way, they've been around a while. Well, do you have cases. what's called a chairman's mark, I mean, that is presented so that everyone knows w what the starting point is? 
with these uh, bills, with your bill? Well, when we get our allocation from the full committee, essentially we know what uh, realm of spending we are going to engage in. As I indicated, we reduced that by almost 50 million, but that's the beginning of the pairing back of what has been submitted by all of legislative branch agencies, which admittedly uh, <coughs> does not go through an OMB-like process. We are the OMB and the Appropriations Committee for this branch of government, as we should be, given the comedy that we maintain between the branches. Well, I've taken a lot of time. I thank you for clearing up some of those things. I, maybe the last thing you could clear up for me are, are orange, is oranges from Florida or California the best? Um, when eaten in Tennessee, I'm sure they're not even aware of the source. <laughs> Uh, that, that's that's a that's a great debate, and I have my answer, and I'm sure Vic will have his. Uh, We're trying to maintain our bipartisan. Yeah, I guess we, we, that would mess up the whole. Uh, if I, we tried Mr. to. Mr. Gordon, I don't want to, to uh, add any discord to this meeting, but you asked an important question. Uh, you asked about the chairman's mark. Now, I've been on the appropriations committee for a long time, and I've seldom seen a chairman's mark until the members walked in to that room to begin marking up. And I also would have to tell you that the policy normally is that the chairman's mark doesn't leave the room. In other words, I don't take it out when I leave the room, and neither does the other members or my staff. So the chairman has a great latitude in the appropriations process that other members do not have. And so we begin from a mark that the chairman has had a great opportunity to work. Now, Mr. Fazio is very cooperative and gives us whatever time we need to work on that chairman's mark. But we don't see it until basically the last minute. And then, for the most part, we're not even permitted to take it out of the room until such time as we have, uh, we have finished the markup and have made our report to the full committee. Although somehow one always seems to leave anyway, but that is the rule. <laughs> well, I didn't take it out. <laughs> I, know. I know you didn't. I know who did. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I do have some questions. First of all, I'd like to... Uh, thank Mr. Fazio and uh, Mr. Young for a very good presentation. That was probably one of the most coherent and fact-filled uh, opening remarks I've heard since I sat here, and I'm delighted. Uh, I think it's important because, uh, as Mr. Young said, this is an area of not only economizing and trying to do the best with the dollars and get the most efficiency out, it's an area of example setting. And for that reason, I think there's an extra scrutiny that comes into this particular particular appropriation legislation, and I want to make sure that that scrutiny uh, follows through. Uh, but I think you've done good work. I, your testimony did raise some questions. First of all, you indicated that you have indeed made a cut in the full-time uh, equivalency uh, positions, and yet we at the same time find a $51 million increase. That is a little bit of an alarming trend to suggest that we are laying off people and yet having more expenditures. And is that a trend we're going to continue to see, or has that uh, been taken into consideration by your deliberations? Well, as I indicated in uh, response uh, to some of Mr. Solomon's introductory remarks, if we were to fully provide for the pay and benefits that our employees deserve, we would have to start by adding $80 million to this bill uh, just over last year without adding one person. And that is not only because of the FERS contribution we now have to make, as I mentioned earlier, that used to be made by the Treasury for all our employees in government, but also because now as members of the Social Security system, we have to make the employer contribution. We, like other employers in our country, are having to pay more for health care costs for our employers, employees in the Federal Employee Health Benefit Plan. Um, we now have locality pay, which while we haven't provided for it, is being provided automatically to most of the federal workers unless it's restrained by other subcommittees of the Congress. So we have a 6% plus increase on the day this bill is submitted to Congress uh, to reflect the normal cost of maintaining 75% of this bill, which is people. So what That's you're saying is the benefits package is increasing so much every year for everybody that we're having to lay people off. Well, I think we probably should reduce spending and reduce, and that's proportionate, obviously, and obviously. the size of this branch, not by making reductions in the appropriation, but laying off people. Uh, I see Mr. Michael has asked to make an order, an amendment, that would continue the 4% 
standard, which we included in this bill for the first time last year to reduce the number of employees here. We are ahead of, in effect, the requirement we were to we impose on ourselves in last year's bill. And I would hope that we would stay the course, complete the reductions in the number of people in this branch, and then take another look. I'm not prepared to say I'm committed at the moment, as Mr. Michael's amendment would commit us, but I think it is personally the proper way to go. And when we complete this reduction in personnel, we should consider further reductions down the road as a much better way to go than simply slashing appropriations generally. And I think that's been the uh, conclusion that many have reached in the reinvention of government approach that we've taken uh, under uh, Vice President Gore's direction. Well, I know this is going to go on and on, and uh, I, I just wanted the assurance that you're aware of that and you're going to deal with it. And in that vein, uh, with those other expenditures down the road, which have already started this year of necessity, and I uh, got specific questions on them, did you do you go through the expenditures for the ledge branch? Uh, uh, make any distinction between nice to have and need to have, or have criteria like that oh, where sure. there's you do well, absolutely. In fact, uh, some of the reason why this bill is an increase after three years essentially of less spending in real dollars, not from a baseline, not. Uh, in any other way, is, is that we have probably begun to see some real um, neglect of the, of the physical plant show up. Um, and that's why I think we would want to present the members with some of these uh, sizable expenditures for, say, the new elevators in the Longworth building or uh, repair of elevators and, and um, escalators, the beginning of the replacement of the conservatory at the Botanic Garden. These are things that have uh, really, frankly, been deferred, delayed, because of our desire to cut. It's and your we can only do that so long without incurring larger costs down the road. It's your basic feeling there's nothing in here that isn't a need to have. Well, I, I think that, frankly, members need to make some judgments, and certainly some of these amendments will allow for that. Um, there are clearly things in here that we have deferred for several years and felt this year we needed to go forward on. For example, we've had some fires in the... Uh, air conditioning system here. We've had some PCB problems that we need to continue to work to remove from generators here. We have to protect not only the people who work here and the members certainly, but many, many, many people who visit here. And we need to take care of these things if we're really providing the proper maintenance of what is a national monument, the capital of the United States. You, in your testimony, you spoke to some additional uh, pay for some nurses. I didn't quite uh, follow that. We had a, a pay scale for the nurses who were employed in the various buildings here that was, we thought, less than many other federal agencies are providing and unnecessarily restricting their ability to be promoted on the basis of merit. So we've added another category which would allow some flexibility in how we would compensate the nurses. This doesn't affect the number of nurses. This just means we've got a top category to Well, we'll leave the them to. management of these people to the attending physician and others who have responsibility. Uh, but we have had a number of people who, uh, through 20 years of service, have uh, nowhere to go and will have hopefully many more years to serve us. And we thought it would be advisable to give them another level of pay if they merit it based on what their supervisor decides. Not to say that they go immediately to the top of that scale based on the number of years in, but give them an opportunity for an increase in pay. <coughs> the, um, the other areas, uh, two quick further points, Mr. Chairman, I'll be brief. Um, Mr. Frost made the point that there were no amendments that went to the members' uh, clerk hire or allowance, office allowance. That is incorrect. I, in fact, do have a, I think, a very uh, strong amendment in that does address this issue, probably much too strong uh, for many members. Uh, and the reason I did that, put that amendment in, is perhaps somewhat, if I could remember, Mr. Natcher. I think he's a man that we admired greatly, and uh, Mr. Natchez, I remember, uh, never came anywhere close uh, to using his clerk hire or his office allowance, and he was one of the most effective members of this institution. Um, and I believe that that kind of example is the right kind of example to set. Uh, certainly he was well regarded across this country and received uh, tremendous praise while he was alive in his death. Uh, the other area there, the franking, uh, I, I was able to contain myself during some of the debate. 
Uh, we answer every letter we get. I would suggest that we probably get as much or more mail than most con uh, congressional offices. And I don't spend anywhere near 25 percent of my franking allowance out of my office to answer every inquiry that comes in. And I suppose, truthfully, every member could say the same thing if they broke out the mass mailings and the public mailings and the uh, pseudo-advertising and, uh, quote, information distribution, unquote, that goes on with the use or the misuse. My view is that uh, franking is an area that could take a wicked hit, uh, and probably America would be better off for it, as well as save some money. Would, would uh, 300 uh, million over five years be a wicked hit? Uh, I will tell you frankly that if you cut the, the franking, off, franking allowance down to 25 percent of what it is today, most members could go about their business, I think, just as effectively uh, as they do today. And perhaps America would be more fairly informed if we did that. Well, I, I recited earlier what public opinions consistently show. Polls show the public does like to communicate, I, I, be communicated with by their member of Congress. And I personally think much of the mail that goes beyond the uh, response mail that you cited is for town hall meetings, and I think that is part of <coughs> the American tradition we ought to perpetuate. That's the reason why I haven't suggested we go to 25 percent, because I agree with the town hall meeting. We've tried it both ways, and there's no question we get better response when you mail out those postcards than you do when you put an ad in the newspaper, and I agree, and that's why I'm not looking for a draconian cut on Frankie, but I am looking for a realistic cut, and some of this uh, uh, excuse we use to justify the levels that it is at now, it seems to me, are not helping this institution at all. Because while you say most Americans want to get the information, that's true. But when you tell them the price, then they have a second thought. And I'll put it this way. When you ask most Americans, if you ask 100 Americans today whether they approve of the way the United States Congress is being managed, 83 of them will say they disapprove. They do not approve. Mm -hmm. That means we've got... Do you got, think they're warranted in that position? Uh, I think that they are warranted in that position to the extent they do not understand what goes on here or well, what our needs are. And that's why I want these public debates. If they don't fully understand what goes on here, they could quickly conclude that things aren't going well here. And I think, frankly, to a large extent, the members of Congress themse themselves, excuse me, are responsible for the negative image the institution has because the easiest thing to do to win favor with your constituents is to separate yourself from the institution, ironically, the one you're working so hard to be part of. That usually goes over very well. Whenever the institution is held in ill repute, as it historically has been, separate yourself. I'm not one of them, I'm one of you. And of course, it's a very easy thing. We all slip into it on occasion, some far more than others. In this bill, is probably the one place that people can look to on an annual basis to register some more of that sort of message. Well, the reason I mentioned the Frank is particularly think that the Frank is probably used to create that division more than almost any other tool that is available to a member. That distancing of oneself between uh, his or her job and the institution. So therefore, if we cut the Frank a little bit, maybe we would have a little less despair about the institution. Well, Thank I think you, we have Chairman. cut it a little bit. In fact, 40 percent at the moment is the level that we are providing of the authorized amount. So yes. we are, and historically have continued over the last five years dramatically, to move down from the authorized amount. I suspect that's more public pressure uh, and realization of what's going on than it is uh, anything else. I've watched that number move up and down by tens of millions uh, in the five years I've been here uh, in either direction, <laughs> depending on whether it's that year in the cycle, whether we have to, quote, get more information out because we've completed two years of things, or whether it's the first year when it's not so important. I'm not sure whether the C-SPAN camera can see this, but the top line, the level line here is the blue line, of the authorized amount. The red line is the appropriations line, which, as you can see, dives across the chart here. As it should. And the green line is the level of consumption, which at the moment is uh, below what the appropriation yeah, is. Yeah, that sawtooth line that goes up and down in election years, that's the one you're referring to? That's the one I mentioned earlier that I think reflects more than elections the fact that we wait until we've been here for six months at least into the first year of a cycle before we begin to report to our constituents on what, if anything, the Congress has accomplished. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, one thing, if I might respond to further to Mr. Goss. Uh, like you, like you, I, uh, I don't use 25% of my franking allowance. But just to show you that our heart's in the right place and that we're, that we're trying, 
Uh, we did reduce the official mail cost considerably in our recommendation. We have reduced uh, dealing with the LBJ interns. We've reduced the former speaker staff account. We've even reduced the miscellaneous items account. Uh, we reduced the account of the office of the attending physician. We reduced the account of the Capitol buildings and grounds and the Library of Congress. So uh, we, we have made some re recommended some reductions. And if, if you will, will allow us to have some of the amendments that, that, we've, that we've asked to be considered and approved, uh, we'll make further reductions on the floor. I thank the gentleman for bringing that out. And I, I agree. I don't want to be negative in my comments. Uh, I was just trying to uh, participate in the continuation of the debate we've had so far. Uh, I you think make, that you make a very great contribution to any debate you're involved in. I, I thank you, I, I also am glad that you've pointed out that good work has been done, because I did start off my commentary by saying I appreciate the work you've done, and I sincerely mean that. And if I might add, we don't oppose uh, a number of other amendments uh, that will allow the members to decide on whether they want to replace these elevators or what have you on the floor. I think it's probably best that we decide as a group, all of us, rather than have a subcommittee of the House. I, I agree, and decision. I'm glad you said that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it's the intention of the chair to keep continuing right through the roll calls so those people who have to vote get out and vote and come back. And uh, I'd like to call Congressman Thomas to the, the uh, dais. I know you've been patiently waiting, and I know you've got another meeting, but uh, it was the questions that kept the panelists here more than their testimony. I, I understand that, Mr. Chairman, and I have all the answers, and they've all left uh, <laughs> in terms of the mailing, and it's unfortunate. Uh, I'm not here because I'm looking for cameras. Uh, I'm on call at the Ways and Means Committee to talk about health, so I'm not here for cameras. Uh, every day I commit myself to this institution with my butt and my mind as the ranking member of House Administration. So I'm not here in some dilettante pursuit uh, in terms of uh, trying to score points that don't need to be scored. A lot of focus is put on franking, and I'll tell you why a lot of focus is put on franking, because there have been significant reductions in large part due to the changes that the, the chairman of the Legislative Appropriations uh, Branch Subcommittee indicated. In 1991, the Fazio frenzel Amendment put responsibility on individuals for the first time in terms of their mailings, rather the institution. At that time, there was a capping of three times the first uh, class mailing rate to determine the amount of franking money available. Currently, the first class rate is 29 cents. We reported to you changes that we were making from House administration in the handling and the processing of mail. We spent several million dollars in anticipation of saving even more. We've been able to do that. Currently, mail is sent at a 14.88 cent rate, half of the first class. So when you take the way in which the member's money is actually determined, the number of mail, three times 29 cents, Given the fact that we can mail for half of that cost, members actually can send six pieces of mail rather than the three that are established. Members have not utilized that level of mailing. In fact, as the gentleman from Florida pointed out, members are using less than half of that amount. The current allocated amount is 77.5% of the amount that could be authorized. What my amendment does is very simply bring uh, the structure in line with reality. It reduces from three pieces of mail to two pieces of mail as the multiplier formula. So instead of six actual pieces that could be mailed, it's four pieces that could be mailed. And members are currently mailing at less than the four-piece rate. If, in fact, the two-piece rate was the multiplier, there are only seven members of Congress that would be affected at all in terms of their mailing account. Conveniently, it's four Democrats and three Republicans at the top of the list. The point is, if we really want to make a statement about the kinds of reductions that are going on, we could reduce the multiplier from three pieces of mail to two pieces of mail, and it would not affect in any way the current mailing practices of the members. It would reduce from 77.5% of the authorized amount to 66.6% .6 of the authorized amount. There was a 10% reduction offered by the chairman. This is a 14% reduction. But it is a dramatic way to say that we're limiting from three to two. And all we're really doing is bringing in line the authorized multiplied structure with the actual behavior of the members. I think that's a far better way of dealing with this issue. 
On other items, let me say briefly, as a teacher on leave, I think it's wrong to cut the LBJ program. It is a very rich, nourishing program for young scholars. There are a lot of other ways to save money. In my opinion, that's the worst way to save money. Uh, my name is on another amendment by Mr. Barca a little bit later. It's because in moving to this new electronic highway that's been talked about, we believe there are significant savings. And we ought not to increase money to produce these savings. Just as in the mailing area, when you incorporate new technology, you actually save. We should not front load those savings. They should make those changes out of the savings that they're going to make. Chairman also mentioned that in report language, there is a suggested restructuring of the franking and the printing, uh, of the folding room and the printing structure here. I'm sorry to say that what we're doing is talking about copying the Senate. Uh, the Senate actually has a better method of doing it uh, than we do, and it will save money. That's additional savings on top of the actual cost of mailings. Let's anticipate those savings as well and make my amendment in order, which would reduce the official multiplier from three pieces of mail to two. It would require a waiver, but interestingly enough, the Fazio frenzel amendment was originally a waiver on appropriations to begin with. That kind of a statement, I think, will send a clear message that we are bringing in line our authorized amounts to our actual use. There should be no comfort in keeping that enormous cushion that isn't being used. And that's why I've asked my amendment to be made in order. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Solomon? <clears throat> Bill, I missed the earlier part of your testimony, but I'm fully aware of, uh, uh, of your arguments. Uh, certainly, um, I think it makes sense. I, for one, depend on, uh, on district-wide newsletters. I have a district that's 10,000 square miles, and it's very mountainous. It's hard to get television, uh, radio, and, uh, and I depend on that to reach, uh, reach uh, my constituents. But nevertheless, um, I think that it, it certainly makes sense, and we will do everything we can to... Well, we're mailing, uh, we're mailing, and the point you may not have heard was that although we're using three times the mail times the 29 cent rate, it's only costing us 14.8 cents to mail. Right. So we actually get six pieces for that amount, and we're using less than four. Right. We should reduce the multiplier from three times to two times. I agree with that 100%, and I'll vote for your amendment. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Mr. Goss. Well, you <laughs> Mr. Roberts, I think you're probably next in this. Is Mr. B. Ryder? Mr. B. Ryder, sorry. Doug, come on up. We have a bet on. We have a bet on? Yeah, we have a bunch of bet on what time gets up there. And I win. If How may we help you? <laughs> we know. Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Solomon, members of the committee, thank you for an opportunity to testify. My amendment would reduce the funding level uh, for the General Accounting Office to 5% below the fiscal year 1994 level. GAO received a funding level of $430.2 million in FY94, and this bill increases at $9.4 million. My amendment would reduce the fiscal year 95 funding level to $408.7 million reduction of 30.9 million from the committee approved bill and 21.5 million below the fiscal year 1994 funding level. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the committee, this is the first time in 16 years I've proposed a uh, amendment to the legislative appropriation bill. I'm not gonna issue any press releases about it. No one has asked me to offer this amendment. I simply have grumbled and griped about the growth of the GAO long enough, and I decided, looking at myself, at least I have to try to do something about it. And I think a 5% uh, cut is a modest cut. I think this agency has, is an agency whose growth is out of control. It's not particularly responsive to individual members of Congress. I believe that the work quality of their work is increasingly shoddy. I have no particular instance or, uh, or a circumstance that causes me to be unhappy with it per se. It's not a grudge that I have against the agency. But if you take a look at what's happened between 1985 and 1993, an eight-year period of time, they did double their number of investigations from 457 per year to 915 per year. Take a look at the period, however, where from 1965 to the current level of funding, and you'll find that, admittedly, in unadjusted dollars, the budget for GAO has gone up almost 1,000% in that period of time. 
This is a very, very large bureaucracy. I certainly understand there may be capital expenditures, which I heard about here a few minutes ago, some changes that perhaps need to be made over in the building itself, perhaps some equipment. But I think taking that into account, a 5% reduction from, last year, from the current year level is not inappropriate. And this is the case that I present to you for uh, my amendment, and I would like to see it made in order so the members have a chance to vote on it. I thank you for listening. Thank you, Doug. Any questions of Mr. B. Ryder? Mr. Solomon? <clears throat> Doug, uh, I have uh, no criticism of the General Accounting Office. I think they do good work. But I think it's, um, it's uh, noteworthy that uh, you mentioned that your 5% your cut is uh, modest. It's modest, yet it saves $30 million, almost $31 million. And I think that shows the, the magnitude of how much uh, is spent on the GAO. Uh, we have the same situation with the Congressional Budget Office, with the Library of Congress, and it goes on and on and on and on. And the only way that we can set the example is, uh, is to tighten our belts and to tighten their belts and to tighten everybody's belts. Otherwise, this country is going down the drain. So I hope we are able to make your amendment in order. I appreciate you coming. Thank you very much. Mr. Goss. I have only one quick question. Why did you decide on 5%? Because I thought, uh, Mr. Goss, I thought it might actually be acceptable to get the rule approved to permit this amendment. I, as I said, I think it really should. You should take this agency and shake it down in size and shake some efficiency out of it, like, like 15 or 20 percent. But I don't think that's feasible to, uh, to do at this point in a political sense. I, I think I agree entirely with you, and I think you have given us a practical amendment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Manton, gentleman from New York. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing and allowing me the opportunity to bring a matter of great importance to the attention of this committee. Uh, I'm here as chairman of the subcommittee on uh, police and personnel, uh, subcommittee of House Administration. As you may know, Congresswoman Jennifer Dunn and I have introduced legislation H.R. 4227 that would change the mandatory separation age for a United States Capitol Police officer from its current 55 years to 57 years. We'd ask you to make an order, an amendment based on the text of that legislation to H.R. 4454, the Legislative Branch Appropriations Act for fiscal year 1995. The uh, Capitol Police Retirement Act of 1990 also known as Public Law 101-428, placed the United States Capitol Police Force on a more level playing field with surrounding federal law enforcement agencies. A key provision in this legislation made the mandatory separation at age 55, which was identical to the retirement provisions of similarly situated law enforcement entities. This legislation had widespread support because it ensured parity, equity, and compa uh, comparability among federal law enforcement agencies. However, in the Treasury Postal Appropriations Bill for fiscal year 1991, language was adopted that increased the mandatory separation age for these surrounding federal law enforcement agencies from age 55 to age 57. This change was not included for the U.S. Capitol Police. Mr. Chairman, the amendment we are proposing today is necessary in order to restore parity. The Capitol Police and the Capitol uh, Police Board strongly support this change and it is my understanding that they have the sufficient resources to accommodate this increase in mandatory retirement age. Thank you for consideration of our proposal. Thank you, sir. Um, I think you said that Ms. Excuse me, Ms. Dunn is a, is a co-sponsor of the... Yes, she's the ranking member on the subcommittee. Should the committee make it in order? Should she be a, a co co-author of the amendment to That's that fine. meet with the yeah. gentleman's approval? Yes. Mr. Solomon. Tom, I don't have any questions. It's certainly uh, a clear amendment. We hope we can take care of it. Thank you. Mr. Goss. I have no questions, nor do I have the amendment. I'll find out why I don't. Thank <laughs> you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Pat Roberts. We thank you for your patience and waiting, sir. He's not on the uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, prior uh, to discussing the amendment I would like to have made an order, I would like to associate myself with the remarks 
of the, my previous colleague, uh, or my colleague who spoke just previously to me, Mr. Madden, uh, being the co-author of the bill that brought parity to the Capitol Hill Police when I had the privilege of being the ranking member on the Police and Personnel Subcommittee. We do try to be consistent in regards to other law enforcement agencies. I don't believe it will be a controversial uh, amendment and would hope uh, uh, that we could make that in order. Uh, once again, I very humbly find myself before your committee to ask for what I consider to be reform in the way the House has operated and also with an amendment that I think would save considerable money. I continue to believe that we do have uh, too many House employees. I'm not talking about the personal office staff. I'm not talking about the committee staff uh, so much. Uh, Mr. Frost and I, who serve as the chairman and the ranking member of the accounts uh, subcommittee, when we go over uh, what we spend in regards to the committee funding, uh, try to do our best to get uh, those levels to where they should be. But I'm talking about House employees that are doing functions that I think could easily be done by private enterprise or by contracting out. I have an amendment very similar to legislation I introduced in the 102nd Congress, 103rd Congress. It would require the House to eliminate almost 700 positions, evaluate the current office function and need, and then contract out the services we feel compelled uh, to maintain. I have strongly advocated for years that support operations in the Congress do not necessarily have to be operated and managed by House personnel. Instead, just as we have done previously in the House restaurant system and the House child daycare center, I think that private enterprise should be allowed to enter into agreements with the House. Uh, obviously, we'd have to recognize the financial support and the facilities that are being provided. The House then could uh, monitor and enforce the provisions of the agreement to ensure that our needs are being met. I know that the Congress is a very unique institution. I know we have to be able to provide special services for our members, timely and professional service, and a true recognition that this is the people's house. I know we're unique. But unfortunately, in the current, in the current organization of, of support personnel, I think we can do better. Why do we continue to operate a barbershop for $113,000 in annual salary costs when their yearly receipts only total $58,000? I can tell you part of the reason is that we raised the price to be commensurate with the outside service and less people go down to the barbershop. I'm told a private contractor would cut costs, increase business, and make a profit. My answer is, or my suggestion is, why let's just let them. Now I know the answer in, in opposition to this is called control. Uh, we the Congress cannot let go for some reason and insist on having our employees do everything. It isn't so much that those employees would be let go. I'm sure a private contractor would look very favorably on hiring at least a portion of the same employees. I think the time's come. We have a real crisis in trying to achieve a 4% reduction in personnel. You've heard ample testimony as to whether or not that should come out of clerk hire, expenses, allowance, franking, or whatever. Uh, here's a suggestion that uh, uh, would cut the House positions by 694, annual salary savings of approximately uh, 21.7 million. The savings figure does not include the benefit saving that would put the figure just below 30 million. So I would hope my, uh, I would hope the committee would take into consideration uh, in regards to this proposal, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Any questions of the gentleman, Mr. Solomon? <coughs> Mr. Pat Roberts, uh, everybody knows that you do yeoman work uh, on the House Administration Committee. It's a, a thankless job. I'm not sure that many of us would even want that job, but uh, uh, certainly uh, your amendment would uh, save $21.8 million in salary cost. It certainly goes, uh, sets the example, and it's, uh, it's, uh, cap we're capable of doing it, and I hope we can make your amendment in order. Appreciate you coming before us. Thank you, Pat. Uh, if I could be permitted to speak yes, very briefly course, to the uh, uh, Klug uh, LSO amendment and to the amendment uh, to be introduced by Mr. Klug on the GPO, uh, I suppose I am recognized in the House as the Dr. Kevorkian of, uh, of LSOs. But uh, we have a situation where 
as I indicated uh, to the Rules Committee last time around, uh, that for 10 years we did a study and find out, found out there was approximately $7 million missing in regards to accounting and in reference to LSOs. That's been taken care of to some extent in regards to the record keeping, but we have yet to adopt the regulations that in the, the uh, or uh, pardon me, uh, we have yet to adopt the regulations in regards to the uh, relationship with the LSOs and outside organizations and any public kind of reporting in regards to the year-end report. I just think if we're in a situation here where we're asking individual members to cut back and we're going through the crisis of the 4% cut where we're, where we're authorizing uh, less and spending more, that LSOs are truly a luxury that we can't afford. Now, Mr. Kluge's going to have the amendment this time, not Mr. Roberts. And then he also has an amendment with the uh, GPO. Let me just show you something here. This is a chart about the government uh, printing office. And it shows here, in terms of profits, that we were doing fairly well up to 1990. And then look at this. And yet the number of employees have decreased only slightly. And let me point out that in recent hearings, uh, we learned that if you contract out your typical contract with the GPO, uh, we make about $107. Uh, if you have it in-house, you lose about 1027 with all due respect, the GPO is a tar pit agency that hasn't caught up with the printing revolution that's taking place. Mr. Klug uh, has an amendment that will strike 300 full-time positions from the GPO baseline. It would save us about $29 million. I think it's a good amendment. Thank you, Canada. sir. Thank you. Appreciate it. Appreciate it as always you're coming up here. Mr. Lancaster. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and ranking member. Uh, I appear before you today to testify with regard to an amendment that I would like to offer to the legislative branch appropriations that I hope you will make an order under the rule. Uh, my colleague Scott Klug has a similar amendment, which I understand he will withdraw and will ask to be uh, a co-sponsor of this amendment, and I welcome his support on this amendment. This amendment would strike uh, $4,441,000 from the appropriation for congressional printing at the government printing office. The reported bill had provided $95,158,000, or an increase of $6,754,000 over the current year for congressional printing. That size of increase is unnecessary for two reasons. First of all, the GPO projects as a, have declined in the fiscal year 1995 which is a typical pattern during the first year of a new Congress. But more importantly, the GPO asked for this $4 million plus increase because they wanted to raise printing costs throughout the government. And this was the share of those increased costs for Congress. However, on May 12th, the Joint Committee on Printing by resolution directed the GPO not to raise those rates. Uh, they correctly, I think, determined that such an increase in rates would drive away even more customers and would worsen their already difficult financial situation. Since that rate increase was not approved, the funds that were included for that rate increase are not needed either. So I would ask your support for making this amendment in order. It simply removes from the bill the funds that were included in the initial request to cover a rate increase which has been rejected by the Joint Printing Office. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on this amendment. Well, thank you, Martin. Sounds like a very sensible amendment. Mr. Schreier. Thank you very much. We thank you, sir. Mr. Thomas, I guess you're next, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for the chance to appear in your committee today. The amendment I plan to offer to H.R. 4454 would reduce the budget of the General Accounting Office by roughly 15 percent from about 439 million to 373 million. The GAO has become a massive bureaucracy with a staff of over 4,700 people. The GAO budget amounts to about one-fifth of the legislative branch spending. Over the years, uh, the GAO budget has steadily increased. In fact, this bill would increase uh, about 2 percent. 
My amendment is designed to bring a little fiscal responsibility to the process. It would cut 15 percent of the funds from GAO, put it back approximately to 1980 level. And I understand fully the need uh, for the Congress to have and the House to have oversight and investigations regarding the activities in it. GAO performs certainly an important function. I do have serious concerns about the priorities and, and, and uh, the feeling that from time to time these studies are made to sort of substantiate or legitimize a political position of the chairman or the subcommittee chairman or even ranking people. So my amendment is, uh, I think, fair. Let me just point out a couple of things here. Um, as recently as 20 years ago, GAOs initiated most of their own inquiries and were more of an independent research function. Now more than 80 percent of the GAO reports are a result of congressional requests, most from committee chairman and subcommittee chairman, of course. The overall budget started at $204 million in 1980, now it's $439. One-fifth of the budget, as I mentioned, 4,700 employees. That's 10 for every member of Congress in the GAO eight times the size of the Congressional Research Service budget. Uh, so that's the gist of it. Uh, last year there was an effort, I think, to cut it by 25 percent. This is 15 percent, I think reasonably modest, does not gut the agency, but rather trims it, allows it to continue its essential functions. And we had Thank an, you. And as the gentleman may well be aware, we had an even more modest proposal by our colleague, Mr. B. Ryder, to cut it by 5 percent. I see. Oh, raised, we raised him a little then. Yes, you certainly did. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me uh, just say that we spent a great deal of time on our joint committee in the organization of Congress uh, with Mr. Bauscher and uh, representatives of the other support agencies. And quite frankly, um, uh, we offered an amendment looking at uh, some kind of merger, and I think that that, again, is a responsibility that we need to, uh, to have for our joint committee when we move our package forward. Uh, and uh, but I think that that looking at some kind of uh, of modest reduction is clearly the route that we should be taken. I mean, no no one says that the General Accounting Office does not do good work, but obviously as as cuts are being made throughout, I think this is a a very uh, modest and responsible thing that we should certainly consider. We thank you, sir, very much for coming. I appreciate it. Thank you. Bringing us your amendment, Mr. John Boehner from Ohio. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and uh, my two Republican colleagues. I have uh, four amendments that uh, I'd like to present uh, to the Rules Committee for consideration on the Ledge Branch Appropriation Bill. Uh, the first of these amendments, uh, uh, there are actually two amendments that I'd like to be considered on block uh, that deal with uh, franking. And it would be uh, on page 7 after line 19. Uh, both of these would be in there. Let me explain. The Ledge Appropriation Subcommittee reduced franking expenses, that's our free mailing privileges, uh, by $5 million. Uh, part of the problem that we have currently in this fiscal year is that members uh, are overspending what has been appropriated because the authorization has not been kept in line uh, with the appropriation uh, numbers. Uh, what this would do would be to strike uh, three times the number of households uh, per congressional district uh, strike that and insert two times. Uh, and secondly, in the Second Amendment, uh, what we would do is prohibit the transfer of funds from the clerk hire account and your official expense account uh, into uh, the franking budget that each of us receive. Right now, members can transfer up to $25,000 from one of those accounts into the franking account. Uh, we believe that these two changes uh, would help control the amount of money that's being spent uh, by members on their franc to keep it in line with the numbers that are being appropriated uh, by uh, this bill that we have before us. Uh, the amendment uh, would affect about 125 members who spent last year more than 66 percent uh, of their total franking budget. And so it's not like it's going to affect every member of Congress, it's going to affect several few. I understand that, that this amendment may require a waiver. I would respectfully ask the committee to grant such a waiver. Uh, I understand that the, the full committee uh, probably is seeking a waiver to 
under some issues to bring their bill to the floor and would ask that. Second Amendment, Mr. Chairman, uh, first I would ask unanimous consent uh, to replace my Second Amendment. I have a technical correction in the amendment that I'd like to present to the committee. What this says is that if, in fact, this isn't made in order, my first on-block amendment, uh, that we would reduce the franking budget uh, by some uh, $3.3 .3 million, because that's the amount of money we believe uh, would be saved if, in fact, these first two amendments uh, aren't made in order. Uh, if you look at the, the total amount of spending uh, last year on the frank, and you look at spending 66 percent of it, uh, you take away the top tier that overspent their amount of money, all of a sudden you begin to realize that it's about $3.3 .3 million that could be saved. And I would ask that to be considered if, in fact, your first, the first on block is not agreed to. Uh, the Third Amendment, Mr. Chairman, would apply the Freedom of Information Act uh, to certain congressional agencies. And let me first say that uh, uh, Congress exempted itself from the Freedom of Information Act. There have been efforts over the years to apply that to Congress. Uh, this amendment would only apply it to those congressional agencies, uh, such as uh, the Congressional Budget Office, the Architect of the Capitol, uh, and others. It would not affect uh, members' offices at all. And uh, we believe that it's, it's uh, a step in the right direction. Uh, none of the, the areas that are included in this amendment have their expenses printed in the Clerk of the House report. Uh, all of the areas that are included in the Clerk of the House report uh, we have not included specifically in this amendment. And the Fourth Amendment, Mr. Chairman, knowing that we have a vote going on. Uh, I ask unanimous consent to, to replace my amendment uh, because of a technical correction. Uh, once again. Is your new one a similar one? Pardon me? Your new one is similar yeah, it's, to the old it's, one? it's similar. It's just it that objection. didn't change the, uh, uh, the overall amount in the bill. Uh, and this uh, gets to be a little more complicated. The amendment uh, strikes uh, about $2 million from the statutory funding in this bill. Statutory funding is that amount that goes to uh, the statutory employees on each of the committees. It also includes all of the funding for the Budget Committee and all of the funding for the Appropriations Committee. Now, all of us around here know that the, the big committee here in Congress is the Energy and Commerce Committee. And they spent last year $9.7 million. Next largest committee in most people's minds uh, would be the Ways and Means Committee uh, that spent uh, about $7.6 million last year. Well, during this time, last year, Mr. Chairman, uh, the Appropriations Committee spent $22 million uh, to staff their committee. Uh, I think that uh, it's an awful lot of money. Uh, secondly, let me point out that every committee in the Congress, except the Budget Committee and the Appropriations Committee, uh, are required to come to the Committee on House Administration during the committee funding uh, resolution time each year to justify their budgets. Uh, neither the Budget Committee or the Appropriations Committee have any check uh, on their spending. It's simply included in the Ledge Appropriation Bill. As part of that, uh, each member of the Appropriations Committee is granted uh, two associate staff. Uh, that's 60 members of the Appropriations Committee, multiply it times two, there are 120 staffers that each member is allowed to have, uh, or that is the, the Appropriations Committee has in their personal offices. Uh, these staff are paid on average $73,000, looking at last year's numbers. The professional staff on the committee uh, are paid some average now $77,000. In total, there are 220 staffers associated uh, with uh, the Committee on, on Appropriations. Uh, we believe that there ought to be some reduction in this area. Uh, the amendment that I have before you uh, simply strikes out about $2 million. But the intent of the, committee, of the amendment is to reduce the cost of associate staff uh, down to the level of, of the associate staff that is given to the Budget Committee, which is about $56,000.
Uh, and so I offer the amendment and hope the committee will make it in order. Any questions? I'd be happy to answer. We thank you, John. Uh, Mr. Goss. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. No, I think those are four very solid amendments. I, obviously, the cuts uh, in terms of the members' uh, allocations have been discussed uh, with a number of formulas, and I hope we will be able to get some agreement to get that subject for debate on the floor. The Freedom of Information Act, I think, is extremely important, and uh, I think you're the first I've heard testify on it, and I think it's a very valid and valuable point to bring forward, and I thank you for taking the time. Thank you, sir. Very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Trafficant, you're next, sir. Then we'll go to Mr. Goss, if you wish, sir. Have you voted, Porter? Yes, I have. You need to go. Maybe. I'll see how much time is left. Jim. Mr. Chairman, I have two amendments. The first, I ask unanimous consent to add uh, some language to the Buy American Amendment that has been worked out with the Appropriation Committee. Objection, and that sir. this uh, amended amendment be uh, incorporated in the minutes. Second of all, the text of my entire testimony be incorporated in the minutes. Second one is an unusual one. It deals with the matter of the Capitol Police. Chairman Charlie Rose, House Administration, does not oppose it because it's a sense of the Congress that brings attention to a significant problem where the Capitol Police feel that they're being treated a little bit like children. And in the last 60 days, Chairman, 40 police Capitol Police officers quit and left the employ of the United States government. It cost 50000 to train each of those. $2 million in training went out the, the door. And all of the trafficking amendment says, and Chairman Fazio would not oppose it in being included for discussion if Chairman Rose was not against it, and he's not. And I want to explain this. It would basically state that the Congress would encourage the creation of an ad hoc committee. We would incorporate it into it language that you had, in fact, recommended, that there would be three Democrats and three Republicans from each body, the House and the Senate, and they would review the problems of the Capitol Police and recommend to the Congress some methodology to alleviate this continuing problem that could grow to be an elephant eating our behind here. So the fact is just the sense of the Congress I believe what it might more than likely do, Mr. Chairman, is throw it into hearings. It is not opposed by either the Chairman of House Administration and wouldn't be opposed by the ranking member of the Legislative Appropriation Committee and Mr. Fazio, that I'm asking that you place it in order, and I believe the Capitol Police of the United States government here are asking very much that you show some attention to the problems that have been manifesting in that unit and make the amendment in order. And I'd appreciate if you would. The, uh, the fact that we have 40 officers that have left in the last 60 days underscores the fact that there are significant problems. Maybe we're overlooking them. And it would not be binding, but would bring attention to the plight, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, sir. And your second amendment? The second amendment I said was the Buy American that I asked unanimous consent to include language that the Appropriation Committee had worked out with me and is not opposed to. Good. Any questions of the gentleman from Ohio? Appreciate it, Mr. Quillen. Mr. Goss. I will echo Mr. Quillen's remarks. Thank you. Appreciate you. it. I'd Thank ask you to make an order, Mr. Yes, Chairman. Sir. Thank you. Mr. Goss, if you'd like to go now, it's up to you, sir. And I'm going to, um, if the gentleman wouldn't mind, Mr. Quillen, would you be kind enough to preside? I just have to pop down there to vote. Uh, we only have two minutes left. And I've, Why don't I just wait for a moment? Whatever you wish, or Mr. Quillen can take the testimony, and I'll join in in a minute. I don't want, okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to submit uh, prepared uh, statements for the record. I recognize the gentleman from uh, Florida. Goss, a valuable member of this committee, and as I told Jerry Solomon yesterday, you likewise do a great job here at the table, and you do a great job at the table down there, so we're delighted to hear from you. Thank you very much, Mr. Quillen. I certainly appreciate uh, the opportunity to uh, bring forward two amendments. Uh, I know they're not... 18. Uh, and many have, of course, many more than that, depending on the committee assignments. We have, uh, in many cases, quadrupled 
in some cases only tripled, uh, and in some cases even more, uh, multiplied out the number of staffers here. This is a time when America is being asked to tighten its belt. We've raised taxes. Uh, we have not done a great job of uh, cutting uh, all of the waste here. Uh, and this is an area that is somewhat symbolic, but it's somewhat meaningful, because if this cut were to go into effect, uh, this would save us $3 billion over the next five years. And that is a meaningful amount of money not to be sneezed at even in Washington, D.C. I suspect that at a time when we have declared a bit of a budget victory this year because our budget deficit is only $180 billion, only $180 billion in the hole, that's a victory. When that's a victory, it's time to do something different. And doing something different uh, is starting with ourselves. There is a feeling in America that we take better care of ourselves than we do of our constituents. And I am sorry to say that. And we have to disabuse Americans of that. And we have to prove that we are more concerned with the people we work for than with our own surroundings. Consequently, I have put in this 20 percent cut across the board. I have looked at uh, what that would do to my office, and we can operate very well in those parameters. Uh, I do not think I have a specifically unique situation. Uh, I think it is one that is practical for other members. And I cannot believe that anybody would be seriously put out if we did put in this 20 percent cut. Again, I go back to Mr. Natcher, a very distinguished member of this body until his death recently, which we all lament. And uh, he certainly would have been able to operate very, very easily within these uh, limits that we are proposing. The Second Amendment, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, has to do with another area where literally taking better care of ourselves in America comes into play. It has to do with cutting in half the attending physician's office. When I say cutting in half, uh, it will take two amendments because we have to deal both with the architect of the office amendment, which covers the nurse payroll, and we have to take care uh, of the attending physician's office. I've got to go back to 1929 to bring this uh, into play. At that time, we uh, created the attending, or those here creating the attending physician's office as an emergency because three members died that year. And there was some concern that there was not medical attention or what medical attention there was wasn't rapid enough. So there was an appropriation, I understand the first was in 1930, for $750 to bring three staffers uh, forward. I guess it was uh, one staff and two assistants. Things have grown since then. Right now, our current budget is $1.335 million. Current staff, 29. Additional monies are directed through the architect and the clerk's accounts, we all know. The long and the short of it, which most people don't really understand, is that this, while it was set up as an emergency uh, calls office, a very small percentage of what goes on there is emergency calls. Uh, particularly going back to the statistics of the last two years, only 651 of more than 92,000 contacts in the attending physician's office had to do with an emergency call. Um, and I will tell you, when those emergency calls come, we're thankful for them being there, because we had one in this very room, uh, as uh, we will recall, not too long ago. And I was very grateful that uh, medical aid, uh, qualified medical aid, was available to deal with the problem, and I'm sure the victim of that uh, event was as well. But nevertheless, we discover that the large percent of the contacts in this uh, particular attending physician's office are, in fact, non-members uh, who are coming in uh, for non-emergency services. These are things like aspirin dispensing, Band-Aids, and the use of the cots to lay down on. And it seems to me that we've gotten away from the idea of having an attending physician's office that is there for emergency service to take care of the visitors and the residents of Capitol Hill. And we've gotten way overboard in what we are providing. And I think it does, unfortunately, lend a symbol to the fact that we are indeed taking better care of ourselves. And I am afraid that it is going to be part of the health care discussion as well, because Every time I talk about health care discussion at a town meeting, somebody says, but you have the best plan in the world in Congress. Why can't we have it, too? And as you know, there is a piece of legislation by a member from the other body that pretends, and I emphasize pretends, to give us health care that, in fact, is similar to what we have in Congress have. But as you know, it is subject to rationing and control. So in fact, it is a fraud uh, relative to what we have now. So this is an attempt to try and say we should have an attending physician's office, 
but we can do it very well for its original purpose and provide for our visitors and our members here and our staffers here uh, by cutting it in half, reducing the authorized staff from 14 to 8, uh, reducing the nursing staff through the architect's budget from 13 to 7, and uh, in that case, saving uh, over almost a million dollars in the next fiscal year. I think it's the right thing to do. I know it's not popular, and I know I am not going to win any friends in Washington with this type of proposal, but I think it deserves debate, and that's what I'm asking. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, sir. Mr. Quillen, any questions of um, our friend Mr. Goss? Well, <clears throat> Porter, I agree with your amendments, and I think they at least should be debated on the floor of the House. I thank you, Mr. Quillen, very and much. I'd like to see them made in order. <clears throat> thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. And I would like to take this opportunity to thank the Chairman, Mr. Bielison, for allowing me to be chair of this meeting, however temporary. In my 31 years here, 29 on this committee, I've never seen a Republican handed the gavel. So I'm honored and I thank you. Well, you're very welcome. We've, um... I'd like to well, thank Mr. Bielenson as well. It's an extraordinary show of no, confidence. Mr. Bielenson has done that on two or three earlier occasions. There's no, re there's no reason it seems to him not to. Um, I think Dan Schaefer is next, according to our list and according to his time of arrival. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Members of the committee, I'm uh, going to be very pleased this is a brief amendment that uh, we're dealing with uh, here today. Basically, what we're asking the uh, committee to uh, make in order is... Uh, Push a little button there. Got it. Uh, to make in order is a, an amendment that will uh, cut the uh, spending on House committees by 25%. Uh, now, if you look at the uh, past few decades, the uh, growth in Congress staff has been alarming. In the 1950s, Congress served the nation's 162 million people with a staff of roughly 5,000 employees. Since then, Congress has nearly quadrupled this. The research service reports that since 1981, committee staff has increased 11.16%. Since 1970, committee staff has more than tripled in size. I believe that uh, H.R. 4544 takes the wrong action by increasing the spending by 3.1%. And I think what is more dramatic is the fact that uh, the American people are saying we have to uh, figure out a new way to do this and a new way to uh, approach the budgeting that we do here in Congress. Uh, I and Representative Tim Penny introduced the uh, Fiscal Responsibility Act of uh, 1994, which would have cut spending $550 billion over a five-year period, and uh, this is going to cause some pain. But uh, this in particular, this amendment, was part of that, and saying that uh, we are going to have to uh, cut this committee funding some way, and we feel it can be done with a 25 percent cut, and we're going to be saving $34 million to the American taxpayers by doing uh, this actual thing. Now, this is not an original idea by any means. Uh, matter of fact, uh, the freshman Republicans sent a uh, letter to Speaker Foley calling for a 25 percent cut. Congresswoman Dunn uh, offered a motion to recommit, the, to recommit that would have cut investigative staff by 25 percent, and 171 of our colleagues voted for it. Uh, if you look at uh, followers of Ross Perot's United We Stand, they're calling for a 30 percent cut. So I, I think this is a good step, and if we want to save the taxpayers $34 million, uh, we are going to demonstrate to them that uh, we are very serious about how we indeed uh, do handle our business in Congress. And uh, I would just ask Smith to the record a full without report. A, without objection. Thank you, Mr. Schaefer, very much. Mr. Goss? No, I think we're very much going down the same wavelength. We're a few point, percentage points apart, but our goal is very close, and I thank you for your testimony. Thank you. General from Indiana, Mr. Jacobs. Okay. Uh, Mr. Coppersmith, are you next? <laughs> Mr. Coppersmith and uh, Mr. Hulk, uh, 
um, Mr. Jacobs, is, does anybody uh, feel offended by that lineup? <laughs> well, of course, I'm very honored. <sighs> Peter, you are on this. Are you on this one too? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I wanted to make a couple preliminary comments just in response to the opening remarks that, that you had made. Um, I, uh, I agree with you that we need to cut, but not to the detriment of the public. And I, I hope that you'll agree when you hear what this amendment's about that this certainly is not to the detriment of the public. I, I have no interest in grandstanding or in taking cheap shots uh, or certainly not to weaken this institution. The other thing I wanted to mention is that this is, I think, one of three or four out of 43 amendments that are being offered today that are actually uh, bipartisan. Uh, and, and I thought that ought to be pointed out. Mm -hmm. I appreciate the opportunity to come before the committee to present this. Uh, and uh, I am honored to be accompanied here by Mr. Jacobs and Mr. Coppersmith. The amendment is a very simple one. It cuts $865,000 from the supplies, materials, administrative costs, and federal tort claims line item under allowances and expenses for the House of Representatives, uh, Title I, page 4, line 9. And the purpose is to uh, eliminate the amount that was requested for the purchasing of one million calendars from the United States Capitol Historical Society for use by members of Congress. As you know, each year these, these uh, calendars are purchased by the clerk and given to members of the House, 2,500 uh, to each one, for the express purpose of handing them or mailing them to constituents. Uh, at $865,000 for one million calendars, that's about 86 and a half cents uh, each. We paid, uh, these are paid for out of the clerk's uh, office, not by members. Uh, in addition to that, it costs $1.98 to frank each of these calendars that's mailed out under the frank. Uh, I would submit to you uh, and to this committee that uh, at the time that we have these budget deficits, this is certainly one area where we can comfortably cut spending. These really are nothing more than uh, self-promotional advertising for incumbents. It's an advantage that certainly challengers don't have, and it really is not necessary. If, uh, if a person really needs a calendar, they can, uh, they can get one from their local insurance agent or auto parts store, or they can buy one directly from the U.S. Capitol Historical Society. <clears throat> At the very least, if members feel that the calendar is an essential service, they ought to be able to, they ought to pay for it directly out of their office funds. But we shouldn't have this separate appropriation for what is in essence nothing but self-promotion. Um, I think you should know that since testifying before this committee last year on this same amendment, I have introduced freestanding legislation to eliminate the calendar appropriation, and I have gotten, uh, th th that has 42 co-sponsors on it from both sides of the aisle. Uh, it also has picked up editorial support. The New York Times uh, editorialized on this uh, about a year ago as well in support. Uh, apparently, uh, this passes the germaneness test. The parliamentarian's office concurs on that. And, and I would hope that, uh, that you would, at, at the very least, allow the men and women who are, in fact, the representatives that have been elected by the people uh, to represent them in this House to have the opportunity to make this choice themselves as opposed to keeping this choice uh, uh, locked up and being made here in this committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm not a senator. You're not a what? I'm not a senator. Oh. I'm not going to be. Surprise me. No, not that category. <laughs> Mr. Coppersmith. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a statement that I would uh, like to submit for the record. Without objection, the entire statement of the gentleman will appear on the record. Then I'd, I'd just like to make two points to add to my colleague, Mr. Hogue. Uh, the first is that uh, we're hopeful that by the time this reaches the floor, this will not be just the only bipartisan amendment that you'll be hearing, but this will be the first tripartisan amendment. I believe Mr. Sanders is considering joining us, and that might be a record. The second is, I think Mr. Hoke mentioned, there's really two points here. The first is that this is a collective account. It's out of the clerk's office for a service that members may or may not use. And so by eliminating the collective account, while members remain free out of their own office accounts to purchase calendars if they so desire. We uh, encourage individual accountability and also make it clearer as to which members are, are taking advantage of this and which are not. The calendars are still be there, the, the Capital Historical Society will still be there, and members could still use the publications portion of their office expense account to purchase calendars if they so desire. But this way there won't be a collective account that might mask those individual decisions. The second is, I think, the other point that bears mentioning, that at a time when uh, because of the caps on domestic spending. 
uh, at a time when we are asking every other section of government to set priorities and to cull those things that are good but not good enough. Uh, this is a uh, lower priority. Uh, it is a program. It is an account within the House budget that we can show that while uh, budget cutting begins at home here in this House, that we can set those sort of priorities. It sets a good message because it eliminates a collective account and encourages individual responsibility, and it also shows that we're setting priorities. So while not the <coughs> uh, biggest cut in the world, it's one with both symbolic power as well as good public policy purpose behind it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Jacobs. Uh, Mr. Chairman, when I uh, arrived here in Washington the first time, every member of Congress, I think uh, once a year, got two big foot lockers. Why? Because a thousand years ago, uh, you, you packed everything up and you put it on a Conestoga wagon or something, you went home with a footlocker. In other words, it was an anachronism. Now, I don't say the calendars are an anachronism. They're beautiful. Where, where did you store your anachronism? <laughs> well, it was, uh, it was either in uh, 19 or 1865. I forget. I, think, I don't think the president had a beard at the time. <laughs> but, but, that narrows it down. Yeah, that narrows it down. Or even a mustache, for that matter. <laughs> I, I did want to say that I like very much what Congressman Hoke said, because there's a lot of posturing and grandstanding. I, I hate to call it phoniness just because it is, and I think his sincerity has come through in his testimony here. The, these are beautiful calendars. People like them. People can buy them if they want them, et cetera. But one uh, number I think it's important here is 2,500 per member, 2,500 calendars per member, uh, most people represent about 600,000 people. By definition, a lot of their constituents uh, don't get in on it anyway. Mm -hmm. And I think that to be selective about it uh, is a very good idea, and it should be on the accounts of the members. And I don't want to get too corny here, but um, uh, in terms of priorities and the budget and so on, I mean, how many shots for children, how many this, how many that, that are very much higher on the priority than these things. If people like the calendars, let them dig up 86 cents and buy them. <clears throat> Thank you. Mr. Quillen. Well, I understand the amendment is to eliminate just the calendar. The amendment is to eliminate the uh, line item for calendars purchased out of the clerk's office, as I understand right. it. Right. It, 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 it cuts $865,000 from uh, line 9, page 4, in the uh, uh, in HR 4454, and specifically uh, that is the line that deals with the supplies that buy the calendars for the clerk's office. Thank you. Mr. Goss. Mr. Chairman, I do have a question. I also have a conflict of interest on this, and I want to share it with you because I think it's an interest that you would share as well. It's the U.S. Capitol Historical Society. Uh, this is one of their main fundraising areas. Uh, I listened to your testimony very closely last year, and I was so impressed with it that I uh, purchased the calendars. I, I think you're absolutely right that we should purchase the calendars. What my concern is that uh, if this is their main fundraising effort, are we going to just have another uh, entry someplace else to make up the difference, uh, lose the calendars, and, and have it come another way? Or even worse, are we just going to leave the U.S. Capitol Historical Society, which provides tremendous services to our visitors, and I think a wonderful contribution to our nation and our culture, uh, with no, uh, no funds to do their business? Well, I, I think it's an excellent question, and uh, I, I would answer you with the first an anecdote myself, and that I have a conflict of interest, you might say, because as you know, the executive director, the chairman of the U.S. Capitol Historical Society is uh, the Honorable Bud Brown, a former member from the state of Ohio, for, which happens to be the state that I have the honor of representing. So I, I've, heard, I've heard both sides of this, as you can imagine, Mr. Goss. And, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the fact is that if what we're trying to do here is fund the U.S. Capitol Historical Society, then we ought to do it through the front door and not the back door. It should be a matter of public debate, and we should do that. Um, if that is, uh, it, the other thing that, that really ought to be stated is that the U.S. Capitol Historical Society is a, uh, is a charitable uh, organization, and they have lots of other ways that they can raise money, the same way that uh, museums and, uh, and orchestras and uh, all, all of the other charitable uh, organizations in this country raise money. So but they're certainly not foreclosed from uh, other... Well, well the gentleman yielded. Certainly. Another thing occurs to me, uh, Mr. Goss, and that is if you wanted to historical, uh, the capital historical people to stay exactly where they are now, you could make the direct subsidy and eliminate the postage. 
of sending these uh, sending these things out. Well, I please understand. I'm not being an advocate, and I tried to uh, understand where my uh, concerns were. That I, I do think that they provide a very valuable contribution to our uh, no country, and I, I d wouldn't want to correct one problem here, which. Uh, may be very well worth correcting uh, and make another problem someplace else. And I hope that you will talk uh, with the appropriate people in the U.S. Capitol Historical Society uh, and see how you can share what they might do better or differently uh, if this, in fact, does come forward. If, if the gentleman will yield further, I think there are really uh, two ways to deal with that. The first is to the extent it does, is, does raise monies or profits for the capital, well, not profits, but revenues for the Capitol Historical Society mm -hmm. because it's a nonprofit that amount would be less than the total amount of this expenditure because there are costs involved in printing and purchasing a million calendars. So that if we do go to a direct subsidy, it would be less than that is involved with the calendars. The second is members still retain the option of purchasing calendars themselves. No, I understand that. And so that the, uh, it doesn't go away themselves. It's just that what our, the point of this amendment is don't have a collective account that hides what members may or may not do when it really should be out of their individual office. Uh, I don't disapprove of you focusing light on this. I think this is a problem that needs to be addressed. Uh, I don't know how many members do purchase. I didn't until you advised me it was a good idea last year, and I agreed with you. Uh, I, do other members buy? Do lots of others or not? Do you know? Uh, I don't know. What the, I don't actually know. How, I think that they all of the uh, calendars get distributed. Um, but they're not, the, when you say buy, no member is charged individually for these calendars. For the 1,000. For the, for the uh, 2,500. For the no, 2, I, I understand you have the option to reject that and then just purchase them outright, um, which I believe is what we did. Oh, okay. I see what you're saying. Well, I listened to you last year. I think that's what you recommended. Oh, that's what I recommended last year. That's exactly right. I didn't know that any members did that. To tell you the truth, I'm very impressed. Well, maybe we ought to find out what... Well, I listened carefully to what you said, Mr. Hoax. So. Each member out of the... Uh, uh, one million is allocated 2,500 that comes from the calendars purchased by the clerk. If members do wish to purchase more, they can use uh, out, out from their official expense account up to uh, $2,000, which is the amount uh, allocated for publications. And uh, additional calendars cost 67 cents when purchased from the Historical Society. So that's how much you paid when you did this last year. Well, I know how much I paid because I, I paid it out of my pocket. I wasn't trying to just switch it from accounts oh. into my office. I was trying to deal with it from the way Mr. Hoax suggested it. Which I'm is sorry, the I didn't understand that that's what you were suggesting. I thought that you were suggesting to actually pay for it out of the clerk hire account then no. of your own office. No, I'm, I'm saying let's let's. What we're trying to do is cut ledge branch here down right. to a meaningful right. number. It doesn't do any good to move it from here to here and still right. pay the money. Right. The, the one thing I don't want to. I'd like to save the money, and I'd like not to leave the U.S. Capitol Historical Society high and dry. Okay, but I, I think your idea is when it ought to be. I mean, the other thing that's at the bottom of this is the concern that, in fact, uh, we are not only um, spending money in a way that probably is not very appropriate, but we're doing it in a way that particularly makes us as representatives look good. So that we're self. <laughs> we're doing this in a in a, a self-aggrandizing way to our to our constituents. Well, we found a lot of people really want those calendars and ask for them, and, and to the degree well, that they're willing to pay for, for them, I mean, we I've get them for them. That that's the, the, the most appropriate way to do these things. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Andy, you were around when we used, they used to give out flowers, packets of flower seeds. <clears throat> I don't know why the name Jimmy Burke comes to mind. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's right. I don't know. Uh, Mr. Quillen may have a few of those uh, locker boxes in his basement someplace. I don't know. I think and by the way, you asked me when I uh, exactly when you ask exactly when uh, Jimmy and I ar arrived here with, uh, without our calendars in front of us. Be hard to say just exactly. Yeah, but. Uh, a lot of, in fact, when I first came here, they gave me a footlocker, but since I'd been out of the Navy about 25 years, I didn't need it, so I let them keep it. <laughs> well, and you, you have nothing to remind us of Dracula either, so that I see no use for it. Well, you're very kind. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, gentlemen, for Thank your you, Mr. Chairman. testimony. Mr. Chairman, I, I, if I could just close with one thing. I, I really hope that you'll give serious consideration to this so that we don't feel like we're just kind of going through the motions to come to the Rules Committee and be rejected in a pro forma way. I mean, I, I think, you know, it's something that, the, the, that we deserve to be able to, to uh, vote on on the floor. Thank I hate you. rejection. Thank you. you hate rejection? <laughs> uh, we're going to continue hearing throughout the roll call, so if you people want to get out and vote, it's okay with me. Now, because of uh, people have uh, uh, entered and left uh, and came back again, I, I think the only fair way... Uh, is to call the people by the listing, and if they're not here, we'll come back and get them later. Peter Barker. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have not voted yet. 
yet, so I'll try to be brief here. I haven't voted yet either. <laughs> um, I have an amendment, uh, Mr. Chairman and members, that myself and Mr. Klutschka of Wisconsin and Mr. Thomas of California are putting forward jointly. And basically uh, what the amendment would do is to remove uh, $1.5 million of the amount that was appropriated for the GPO budget um, because uh, basically back in 1993, um, the House had passed the GPO Electronic Information Access Enhancement Act. And as part of that act and as part of the testimony on the floor, it was felt that that act could be implemented without any additional uh, cost uh, to that office. And in fact, in the testimony, both and the reason why Mr. Kletchka and Mr. Thomas are some more supporting me on this is they were the lead Democrat and Republican that had worked on this act and on this bill. And it was clearly understood at the time that this bill was brought forward that we could fully uh, accomplish the goals of this act which was to try to send out information through electronic means as opposed to through the traditional uh, postal uh, department means and that they could do so in a very uh, cost effective manner in a way that would be budget neutral. And uh, as part of their request, uh, they apparently have asked for $1.5 million and uh, it seems to violate the spirit of that which had passed at the time and that which the two lead people working on this uh, had intended for that office. Thank you very much. Uh, this is Don Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is an amendment that strikes $3 million from the appropriation of the Congressional Printing Office at GPO. The bill had reported a $95 million uh, budget with um, a $6.7 million increase. We uh, contend that this, uh, this, the size of this increase is unnecessary for two reasons. Essentially, the GPO, first of all, projects a workload decline in fiscal year 1995, which is, of course, the typical pattern during the first year of a new Congress. Secondly, GPO has asked for uh, $3 million to pay down a shortfall which they claim is owed because of printing done in prior years. This so-called shortfall is, we believe, a subsidy to cover the losses that have been incurred on the executive branch printing, which have been passed on to the congressional printing charge. Uh, we believe that these funds are not necessary and that the printing work has already been done, the labor and material costs have already been charged uh, to the GPO's working capital, and that there's no reason to add an additional $3 million to um, to the funds for something that's already been paid for. I might mention that um, Mr. Torkelson is going to be a co-sponsor of this amendment. We'll be speaking on it earlier, uh, later, I believe. Yeah, we, uh, presented it well, it makes sense. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Thank you. I don't have anybody to, on my side of the aisle, to sit with this thing, so I have to get out by the vote. So uh, I'll vote to get my back. So just stay up. <laughs> Somebody hasn't read the rules. <laughs> You're watching coverage from Wednesday's hearing before the House Rules Committee on appropriations for the legislative branch for fiscal year 1995. The Rules Committee decides guidelines on how a bill is debated on the House floor and what amendments are introduced. Members are considering a $1.9 billion bill for overall congressional operations, including the Library of Congress. We'll continue with the hearing in just a moment, but first a few program notes. This week on Book Notes, our guest is Pete Hamill, former editor-in-chief of the New York Post. He joins us to discuss his recent book, A Drinking Life. Book Notes can be seen each Sunday on C-SPAN at 8 p.m. Eastern Time and again at 8 Pacific. And later this morning, around 10 o'clock Eastern Time, we plan live coverage of a hearing on deficit reduction held by the Joint Economic Committee. Testifying before the committee, economist James Galbraith. 
That's later this morning around 10 o'clock Eastern Time here on C-SPAN 2. We now return to the second part of this hearing Wednesday before the House Rules Committee as members work on a legislative branch spending bill for fiscal year 1995. The Rules Committee decides the guidelines on how debate is conducted in the House. Legislative appropriation deals with money to be spent to run the House of Representatives, including members' expense accounts. The chair of the committee is Democrat Joseph Moakley of Massachusetts. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm here with an amendment off being offered in conjunction with my friend and colleague, Congressman Jack Quinn, who's scheduled, I noticed, to testify also to uh, the committee later. Very straightforward amendment, Mr. Chairman. We propose to cut $4 million from the franking allowance in uh, the FY95 budget. Uh, some history on this point in FY93. 47.7 million was authorized, uh, $24 million expended. Uh, FY94, $40 million authorized. I might note that that amount was reduced 12% on the House floor through an amendment that I offered, which trimmed $5.8 million off uh, of that which came out of the committee. Of the uh, $40 million, it looks like funding will be in that vicinity uh, in the uh, FY94 year. I believe it's time to take another whack at the franc and propose a uh, uh, $4 million reduction, which would represent uh, a funding level of $31 million, a 25% decrease below that of uh, FY94. That's a tough reduction but I believe it is one within which the members can uh, uh, meet their responsibilities to keep their constituents informed. Uh, moreover, I think it signals very clearly to the public that in responsible ways, in ways without impairing the function of the legislative branch, Congress is prepared to step up to the plate and make tough cuts starting right in our own array of office allowances, specifically the franc. So that concludes my testimony, Mr. Chairman. Doesn't the uh committee itself come in with a reduction in franking? They do indeed, and I think that a little more could be done, which is why it's uh, a, a further $4 million adjustment. We don't think that is uh, reckless, but it represents an additional trim with, uh, with which the, uh, the ledge branch could easily uh, survive. Mr. Goss? No, I, I thank you for the testimony. We've got a lot of testimony uh, in this area on cutting the on frank, frank, and yeah. I, I think it is very clear that there's uh, heat out there across America on the members uh, to deal with this, and I hope we're going to have a good amendment. Uh, your amendment is certainly a, a valuable contribution to what we've had so far. I would prefer to go a lot further, but uh, I uh, respect your right to, to draw the line at four, four million, and it's nowhere near enough. Thank you. Thank you, thank thank you very you. much. Thank you. Ooh. Thomas Ewing, I know you've been here a long time. Thank you for your patience. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we'll take only a uh, very few minutes uh, to discuss uh, two amendments that I uh, want to present. Let me give in the way of background that uh, Congress last year uh, passed a 4% reduction in the legislative branch employees uh, appropriation. As part of that, as the way that was met, we cut out all the LBJ intern programs. I wonder if we really thought about that, if we realized that uh, this was the one program that allowed uh, students from minority students and poorer students to have an opportunity to work on the Hill. We all have interns that come and their families can afford for them to work for nothing in our offices and to live on the Hill. But this allowed students who didn't have that financial backing. 
So the two amendments that I present here today is one to fully restore the LBJ uh, intern program at 1144000 and to take an equivalent amount away from the uh, appropriation for investigative staff. And that is my proposal. Do you have another amendment to it? No, the, well, one amendment is to uh, restore it, and the other one is to oh, I, reduce oh, it. Oh, it's the offset. Okay. Uh, Mr. Quillen, any questions? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, that makes sense to me because the LBJ program is important. I think an equal cut could be made. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Goss? I thank you for posed a very fair question to us of whether the LBJs are worth more than the committee investigative staff, and I know where my vote would come down. It's a good debate. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. In fact, I uh, told people they could have less, uh, the LBJ scholarship in my office, and then when they were denied, I had, had to pay them out of some kind of a, a staff allowance to bring them down there, because, you know, once you tell them you're going to bring them down. But I agree with you. It's a it's a very important project, and that just brings to mind what, what happens when people just cut without thinking a lot of things through. And uh, I don't know what's going to happen with it, but I, 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 I agree with your concept. Well, I, I think we want to keep um, the option open for students from uh, less than wealthy families to have the experience working on the Hill. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Oh, Honorable Leslie Byrne of Virginia. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The amendment that I'm offering today will eliminate $7 million uh, in appropriation funds for the renovation of the U.S. Botanic Garden Conservatory. Uh, while the Botanic Gardens uh, serves a very important function for education in our nation's capital, we have to look at money expended for the best purpose. Uh, I will enter the rest of my testimony uh, into the record, but in a nutshell, in 1990, the architect of the Capitol asked for $21 million total to build the conservatory. Uh, this is the first year we've put money into that program, $7 million. The unfortunate thing is that there is no final design, there is no uh, thing that we can look at to say if that's money well spent or not. It seems to me that this money doesn't need to be uh, appropriated in this budget without seeing what we're buying. And so this amendment is pretty straightforward. It holds the money out of seven million dollars for this conservatory until we're going to get a design and see what we're buying. Uh, <clears throat> have you talked with the architect's office? On this matter? The Appropriations Committee has talked with the architect's office, and this is the second year they said the architect's office has indicated that d the design will be there. Uh, it has yet to materialize. Um, the costs have also risen uh, in the estimation of the architect from 21 now to 28 million without a design in place. Uh, I think what we're looking here to do is, rather than just throw money at something we don't know what it looks like yet, is to get the attention of the architect to say, look, if you want to go forward with this new conservatory, uh, why don't we get a design on the table? I uh, think some other members have gotten the attention of the architect through other means. Yes, yes. Well, this, this, is, uh, this is a fairly uh, common sense approach in when we're looking at tight dollars. Uh, building a new conservatory that we don't even have a design for you mean, yet. You mean they'd rip the present one down and build another one? Is that what you're saying? Well, this is to replace the, the botanical old. gardens. Right, the, the conservatory, oh. not not the gardens themselves. Oh. This is a this is a new building. Oh, all right, okay, Mr. Quillen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It looks like we're buying a pig in the pole. Is that right? I think that about nails it. <laughs> I congratulate you. Well put, well handled, and with good appearance. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I congratulate the lady for treading where sacred cows fear to go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I agree with your observation that we ought to know what we're doing before we start spending the public's money. I think that the Botanical Garden is a wonderful, valuable asset to our country, and I've enjoyed it. Uh, many visitors have. It's 
being renovated, but the conservatory question is a very fair question. Thank you. Are you, uh, is this going to be a joint sponsorship? Or? Yes, uh, I, I believe Representative Torkelson has also put in an amendment, and I'd like to have him co-sponsor this with me. Thank you. Mr. Frost, do you have any? No question. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Scott, I think that you've been here next longest. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have three amendments, and let me start in some ways which, with the amendment I think is the most important. Uh, under current projections, the office of the government printing office in 1995 will lose nearly $29 million, and in 1994, $27 million. Over the last four years, there have been four major studies done on the government printing office, two by the GAO, one by Arthur Anderson, and one by the public printer, GPO 2000. And all of the conclusions are very similar, that GPO is overstaffed for the amount of work that's actually done in-house, that it's more effective to cost, excuse me, more cost-effective to contract out work. And finally, the conclusion in all four reports is that GPO personnel must be reduced to decrease losses. In fact, if I can show you, this is a trend line. Uh, since 1984, the green indicates where GPO has made a profit and the red indicate losses. The blue line that you see uh, simply indicates the level of employment at GPO. Now, the Joint Committee on Printing passed a resolution requiring GPO to cut financial losses by the end of 1994. Uh, the JCP also hired a $50,000 consultant to study GPO and make recommendations to reduce losses, but as always, there was a report and nothing was actually done to reduce costs. My amendment would cut the full-time equivalent ceiling of 4,493 positions by 600 to a level of 3,893. That's a 15% reduction, which is equal to approximately $30 million in savings. Now, let me say that my office has had long and protracted discussions with Mr. Fazio, who's indicated that that level itself is not appropriate. In fact, given my choice, we'd be talking about privatizing GPO altogether. But you may hear in the short time a counteroffer of essentially trimming about 300 million slots, excuse me, 300 slots, which is still nearly $15 million in savings. So it's my hope we can put some kind of uh, amendment in place today to allow us to begin making some of the difficult decisions to turn GPO from a money loser into at least a break-even operation. Right. If you look at the, the graph, yeah, and if you see the break in about 1990, two things were happening. More and more work was being sent out of house by government agencies rather than the GPO because GPO printing as a whole is more expensive than work done in the private workplace. And frankly, given the changes in technology, GPO can't keep up with it. And the trend line, I think, also reflects the trend line you'd see in private enterprise, which is more and more work is done uh, in houses computer technology gets better. And if we don't make corrections soon, the $27 million and then $29 million in losses will be even much worse than that. Is the reason for uh, the price being so high is because of schedule after work around the clock in uh, some of well, these that's things? That's one of the arguments to keep GPO in business, period. But again, private printers, given contracts and constraints, manage to deliver on time. And GPO, as a matter of fact, is overstaffed. I mean, the volume of work is expected to decline in 1995, um, but we're not doing anything to adjust the staff appropriately. Okay. Mr. Goss? No, I uh, congratulate the gentleman on the direction that his amendments go, um, and I uh, wish him luck in his negotiations. So I think this is a subject that uh, obviously has gotten a lot of attention and deserves attention. I think we've got to make some improvements, and I think your amendments do. Thank you. Mr. Frost, any questions? No questions? Thank you very much. Actually, I have two more. Second one, very briefly. Mr. Lancaster spoke to you already. And as you know, the way billing works with GPO is the government essentially has an account which they can charge against. Uh, at the present time, the appropriations budget, which Mr. Lancaster has already testified uh, in front of you about, will increase that fund another $4.4 .4 million. And Mr. Lancaster and I have an amendment to simply roll that charge back to where it is. In fact, we didn't even reach the threshold we were at last time. And with work decreasing, there's no reason to raise that ceiling even higher. Uh, and uh, I think Mr. Fazio is supportive of this amendment as well. Um, the final one, which you heard testimony about Mr. Roberts briefly, uh, and I won't prolong what I suspect is a futile chase here, 
uh, would uh, prohibit funding of LSOs and legislative service organizations except for the Democratic Study Group and the Republican Study Committee. Uh, we spend uh, about $35 million over the last 10 years on LSOs. Uh, a GAO study, for example, found that 22% of the tax funds given the LSOs are not appropriately accounted for. LSOs can and continue to spend government money on entertainment, travel, and expensive gifts, none of which I think are appropriate. And uh, there has always been a very dubious relationship, it seems to me, between legislative study organizations and many special interest organizations, which also contribute money to help to support them. And I think we find ourselves in this strange situation where we have 28 LSOs to which members of Congress belong, and then in turn the LSOs turn around and lobby members of Congress on various issues. And uh, finally, I guess the most important point from my perspective would be that there are more than 100 other private groups which uh, essentially serve the same function as LSOs without any kind of special status or without any direct taxpayer funding. Any questions? Mr. Uh, Frost. Uh, Mr. Klug, on that uh, point, the House administration, of course, has been looking at this issue uh, uh, for some time and uh, has been trying to uh, make some reforms in the way that LSOs operate. Uh, I'm concerned that you paint with too broad a brush. Uh, I'm a member of the Congressional Sunbelt Caucus. I find that to be very helpful in terms of providing information about my region of the country. I know there is a Northeast-Midwest uh, coalition that uh, I don't always agree with, but I think is pretty effective in terms of what they do. Uh, I'm an associate member of the uh, Congressional Black Caucus and the uh, Congressional Hispanic Caucus. I have a substantial number of, of black uh, constituents as well as Hispanic constituents in my district. And uh, I think you may paint with too broad a brush in what you're trying to do. Well, th that may be true, and I, I think what we may need to do is tighten up the regulations in the way that LSOs have been allowed to exist. But again, I don't think uh, LSOs are the only way for you to uh, um, lobby and to study issues affecting the black or Hispanic communities or the arts community or um, the Northeast Midwest Coalition, whatever the case might be. My office in particular has chosen not to join any LSOs because we don't think it's an appropriate way to spend money. But uh, I think this is a debate worth having on the floor if you'd give us that but, opportunity. But you, your approach would prohibit any member from making that decision for himself or herself rather than just making it on an individualized basis. Mr. Goss? Well, Mr. Chairman, thank you. I think the LSO question is very legitimate. It certainly should be debated uh, no matter which side of it you're on, and that's what I think Mr. Klug is trying to accomplish here, and I support him in that. Um, my concern is uh, that, you know, we've sort of not gotten the type of uh, horsepower behind the uh, Joint Committee on Reform, uh, suggestions and all the testimony that went in, and I don't know why leadership has not allowed those uh, recommendations to come forward for action by the, the full House, but uh, that's uh, at a different pay scale. Um, the, the point that I would make to uh, my friend Mr. Frost from Texas, I, I agree with him that a member should be free to associate in caucuses or uh, interest groups or of their choosing. The issue here is not their freedom to associate. The interest here is the taxpayer's dollars to support staff. And that's a very different issue. And I think that's what Mr. Klug is getting at. Is it an appropriate use of taxpayers' dollars, or is it a subterfuge, subterfuge to have additional staff uh, to get over the caps and limits that we say we put on our staff uh, here on the Hill? Uh, you know, if you add up the total accountability, which is, I think, what Mr. Klug is trying to get to, you get a different number than the official accountability. And, and I think that's a fair debate. It's a question of honesty uh, in Mr. government. Mr. Goss, I'm, I really don't know uh, uh, where you're drawing your information from uh, because most members don't place staff on any of these caucuses. I've never had a, a staff member work for any of these caucuses. Mr. Chairman, we yield, I was only suggesting that members, as you yourself indicated you do, profit from these LSOs uh, and the staff contributions that are used in support of the LSOs. I would suggest that my constituents profit from that. My constituents profit from the information generated by the Sunbelt Caucus on some very important regional issues that affect Texas and surrounding states. I would agree, Florida. I would include in that. The point of it is, uh, if we are going to have public tax dollars used, why don't we have them used in an open manner and, and in a fair debate and say, these are employees rather than these are extra staff that are over here on an LSO and they don't really count, but we're still paying them. And I think Mr. Klug is trying to focus on that argument. Mr. Thank Klug. you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate uh, your input on all three of these amendments, and Thank I you hope very much uh, on testifying. both the GPO will have an opportunity to cut. Thank you. The Honorable Peter Blute. Mr. Chairman.
Chairman, could I ask that the Honorable Mike Castle join me here? Sure. Similar. Uh... <coughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the opportunity to speak before the committee. Uh, my amendment seeks to cut the amount that Congress spends on franking and thus reduce the legislative appropriations budget by implementing four common sense reforms. First, the amendment cuts the official mail allowance for each member in half. Second, it mandates that unspent franking funds be returned from each member's account directly to the Treasury for def deficit reduction. And third, it prohibits unsolicited frank mailings within 60 days of an election. And fourth, it bans the transfer of funds from members' clerk hire and office, office expense accounts to their franking accounts. These are long overdue reforms, and given the current shortfalls in the legislative budget, reducing the amount we spend on franking would be one of the most prudent ways to save money, in my view. I estimate that had the provisions of this amendment been in effect for 1993, the Congress would have saved at least $7.5 million at no great inconvenience to members. And this savings would rise dramatically to as much as $15 million in election years. A majority of Congress, 248 members, spent under 50% of their allowance last year. If they can show restraint, why shouldn't the remaining members do the same? Cutting and restricting franking is an idea whose time has come. There have been over 30 bills dealing with reform of the frank filed during this session of Congress. These bills acknowledge the sentiment of all of our constituents that there is no longer a need for excessive franking. The fax machine, computer, improved and expanded news coverage, and the advent of cable television make it easy for us to educate constituents about what we're doing in Washington without wasting their hard-earned tax dollars on junk mail. <clears throat> By allowing our amendment, Congress would be given the ability to acknowledge our budget difficulties, public sentiment, and common sense by getting the opportunity to vote up or down for franking reform during floor consideration of the legislative branch appropriations bill. I ask that the amendment be approved by the committee, and I'd also like to register my support for the Boehner Amendment and the Castle Amendment. Mr. Castle. Mr. Chairman, I, uh, I would first like to congratulate Congressman Blue for his tremendous work on dealing with this franking issue. I, I am, could not be a stronger believer in constituent communications, uh, and I think that uh, I probably tie for that with 434 other members of Congress. Um, and I try to do it in every way I can. Uh, I go to meetings, uh, I do the things that you do, that all of us do here. Um, I take my phone calls, I make sure that my staff is responsive. Uh, but we decided early on, when I came to Congress last year, that we were uh, going to deal with this franking privilege uh, by setting an example. And essentially we uh, decided not to take calendars and mail them out, not to send out questionnaires, not to send out newsletters to respond to our mail, and, and we're proud that we responded to all of our mail. I'm afraid to say that for fear somebody's going to say they never answered my letter, but we try to respond uh, to all of our mail. Uh, even when we have town meetings, we do it around organized groups and do it by posting and hustling around and trying to get people there. And last year, I spent less than any other member uh, in the House on, on franking, which was in the range of five or $6,000 or something of that nature, uh, and, and yet I feel we communicated as well as anybody. I absolutely believe that we can do everything that Congressman Blue has laid out here. In fact, I have legislation that even goes farther than that, which I don't think, which I decided not to bring up here, uh, because this is something I think was, is within the realm of possibility and one that we should support. I would just ask that the committee consider it for the purpose of uh, debate. Uh, I think that's what this committee is all about. I believe this is a, a piece of legislation, that the time for which has come, uh, and if we're given the opportunity to debate it on the floor, that we will uh, adopt this or something similar to it. I think you have uh, other amendments in this particular area, but this happens to be stronger than a lot of them, uh, and for, from my point of view, the, the best of them. And I think this is one of the issues that the public is saying, enough is enough. And I wonder how much they look forward to getting those pieces of mail with our, uh, our signatures on them as opposed to a, a real letter from a real friend or whatever it may be. Um, I think this would, would in the long term, uh, help the image of Congress uh, as, as well as uh, uh, reduce some expenditures. We're not going to balance the budget this way, but people want us to live within our means, and I think this helps us live within our means. So I strongly back the legislation of Congressman Blue. Peter, you said you'd want the Congress to cut the franc in half. Did I? D does that mean the uh, the entire uh, package, or each member cut in half of what he's spending on the franc? That would be the uh, uh, entire package cut in half. Okay. Now you say 50% of the people already. Do yes, last year, 50% uh, of uh, the members of Congress spent less than uh, half of their allotment. 
What is the allotment anyway for the franchise? I think it varies from uh, uh, member to member depending on district as a formula. In my case, uh, it was uh, almost uh, uh, close to two hundred thousand dollars. I think there's a formula which a is formula uh, three. I think it's three first class mailings to each household in your district by census, the 1990 census, and it varies probably in amounts between 100 and. 30 or 40, up to close to $200,000, I think, something in that range. I don't have those numbers exactly. Well, I never come close to it, so I never have to look at what it is. <laughs> I'm probably a little lazier. Mr. Frost. I would ask uh, Mr. Blute, uh, Mr. Fazio testified earlier today, and Mr. Fazio talked about the three accounts that members have. Members have three different types of expense accounts. Uh, he talked about clerk hire in his bill go being raised by $15 million as compared with last year. And with ex allowances and expense, expenses uh, being increased by 24 million as compared with last year, and that the franc uh, being cut by 5 million as compared with last year in his bill. Now, are you uh, asking for cuts in the two accounts that have been increased, clerk hire and expenses and allowances, or are you only asking for a cut in the one that's already been Well, cut? my amendment refers specifically to the Frank account, but I would certainly support other efforts, and I believe there are other efforts in front of the committee. There, there are no other efforts in front of this committee to cut those two accounts. Well, I the would only, certainly... The only amendments before us... There are some across-the-board across cuts, board which accounts. would apply to everything in the bill, not just members' accounts. But there are no specific amendments dealing with well, the certainly, two accounts uh, that uh, the committee proposes to increase. Well, I would certainly support uh, keeping those at the same level or uh, supporting reductions of those. Uh, this amendment deals specifically with the frame. Mm -hmm. Which uh, the committee has already proposed cutting by 10 percent. Okay, thank you. Mr. Quillen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. What happens to the... Chairman Moakley and myself, when we spend just a few thousand dollars on there, in, in the account that you want to cut in half, I, what think, happens to those I dollars? think we're the lowest spenders in the Congress. Do we still cut that 50 No, you, you would be, your, your overall allowance would be cut, not the amount you spent in the past. Let's say you spent $10,000 uh, last year, which you may have. Uh, that would not be cut to 5,000, but your, if your allowance was 150, that would be cut to 75,000. So you would still be well within the bounds of the uh, amount of money that uh, would be attributed to your account, and that would revert each year to reduce the deficit in accordance with Congressman Blue's well, What do we do with it? You can transfer it to uh, Clark Hyde. No, you can't, you can't transfer it out. No, you can transfer well, in, you but you can't transfer out, out of the franking privilege. And this, your can legislature this is going to prevent that. call for reduction of the deficit. Well, you know, uh, if so many drips of water hit the ocean, it makes a move. <coughs> Thank you, money. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Goss. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, uh, I think these are fascinating. You, you're hitting, of course, in an area where we've been talking uh, and taking a lot of testimony today. But the, uh, and I want to congratulate the gentleman from Delaware. I know Delaware is one of the least large states, but that is a very impressive uh, franking record. Uh, we've tried to emulate that and not come as close as uh, you have in your the, success. And the what gentleman would yield. It, it is perhaps easier when you're the only congressman from your state, and when uh, the you would be the only one that the media in your state would be covering. Delaware only has one congressman. I, I, will, uh, I will concede that. I think Chairman is correct. It's the reason I'm not asking to reduce it by 90 percent. Right. Also, it's the third most populous congressional district in the country, I might add, too, even though it's a small state. So the Delaware News Journal, he's the only one they cover. Well, I, I think that the, <laughs> the, uh, the, the, the gentleman, the, the chairman from, uh, chairman makes a great point, but we all know that the distinguished former governor and current honorable <laughs> member from Delaware uh, is an extraordinary uh, representative uh, and a great public servant. But more than that, being in that particular lightning rod position, uh, I guess you could make the argument that he needs more franking than anybody else to correct the misimpression and the inaccurate media that sometimes we are subjected to. I would never so, say that. I would never say that either. Uh, to get back to the point. You would be wrong. <laughs> to get back to the point. Um, I think that the uh, point here that's been opened up is the abuse uh, at election time. Uh, we, we uh, mince our words, we tap dance around this subject, uh, we don't want to deal with it directly. Uh, I know how many 
people feel the same way I do when I read those roll call uh, articles and see the pictures in the boxes of the close elections and the people both sides <laughs> of the aisle who abuse the franking privilege. There is no doubt about it. It happens. It's a fact. You can't deny it, and it needs to be stopped. And when you start looking at the numbers, uh, what you are calling for comes, I think, to a very fair allowance and still helps a way to stop that type of abuse. Uh, I know a number of people have testified in different ways, uh, and I think this will allow people who are using the franc properly to very, very generously go about their business and correspond, uh, and will be an aid into stopping that abuse as well as saving some money. So I congratulate you, and I hope we can make an order. Well, if I could just uh, comment on that, that definitely there is a spike up in expenditures on franking during election years. And I think that makes our point that uh, some, at some point these expenditures can be used for political reasons rather than just informational. And this amendment, I believe, would go a long way towards uh, rectifying that. Mr. Solomon, do you have any questions? Yeah. Having arrived late, I know what it's all about, and we support you 100%. Well, thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate it. Uh, I believe our next witness is Karen Thurman from the... Uh, Mr. Chairman, I had another... Oh, I'm sorry. Mr. Kessel, did you have something else you want to testify Because we're all involved with that. And, and so is uh, Congressman Quinn, who has a statement su in support. I ask unanimous consent, although he's here and may wish to speak to it, to submit his statement. Without objection. Is Quinn going to come up? Well, he may be speaking on something else. Are you, He's here, I think, to speak on something else. Th this amendment is, is also pretty simple. Uh, th there's a lot of different ways to go after this, this problem with the, the, the franc, which I view as a problem, and, and I hope that uh, the members of the Rules Committee would as well, when it's misused, that is. Um, and one of the, the, the areas that I think is, is, is really in the area of abuse is the transfer of $25,000 from the clerk hire and official expense accounts into the official mail account. You can't transfer out from it, but you, can't tran you can transfer into it. In 1993, 11 members transferred a total of $177,746.46 into their franc mail accounts. That means that they spent 100% of their franc mail account, which we were trying to cut in Mr. Blute's amendment, and then they spent $177,000 in addition to that. Um, it just seems to me that the, the franc goes far enough as it is. It is a very very generous allowance, I think far too generous. And to allow this transfer, I think it's just a step too far. It's been shown uh, pretty clearly in, in past studies that when transfers are made, it's usually, and I'm not saying in this particular instance, but it's usually in cases in which people are involved in primaries and elections and before the deadlines, they get their mail out uh, and they take full advantage of that. It seems to me that this would be a very simple step if we did nothing else. Uh, we are cutting the, the amount anyhow this year in accordance with Mr. Fazio's original recommendation. And I think combined with this, that we're taking two good steps. I would like to go even farther if we could, but at least this, I think, would be a good rational step to help us start to balance the problem of the, of the frank uh, privilege. Okay. Uh, and were you testifying uh, in furtherance on the Blute Amendment, or were you directing No, sir. Comments? That was my own separate amendment, which should be on the I, list. I don't find that on the list. I think Mr. Solomon and I were both looking I'm for it. I'm looking for it. Number two, Mr. Chairman. No, that transfers it from the office account to, to, uh, to the official mail account. You said from clerk hire. Which is it? Well, I'm sorry. What did you say? There are two up. different accounts. There's a clerk hire account and an office account. Yeah, well, you, your amendment is I think it's it a, as a transfer from the office account. I think account. it's actually allowed from uh, either one. I'm not sure about that. Into the frank account. I'm not sure so which of it's only one of them. Maybe may either be, one. may not be accurate. So the amendment may not be understood. stated accurately in its title. Could I ask a question? Then? Sure, please, Mr. Solomon. Uh, Mike, uh, I understand what you're getting out, and I support uh, uh, your effort uh, to keep the funds from going into the office official mail account, because I do think it can be abused. I just want to make sure that you are not preventing, though, the, the, the $25,000 from going from clerk hire into the office account. No, you know, I, there are those of us that represent an area much bigger than I, Delaware. <laughs> and I have five district offices, and it is very, very expensive. And consequently, we work with fewer personnel in order to maintain those over a 270-mile link. Uh, and I just, you're not trying to no, do that. I mean, you just my, want to keep it from going no, into office. My intent and the intent of the three of us who have been behind this is simply, and I hope it's stated correctly, even mm -hmm. if that title is wrong in, in okay. the amendment we introduced, uh, is simply to prevent the transfer into the Frank account, not between the other accounts. Great amendment. Supported 100%. Okay, any other questions? No, thank you very much, both thank of you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. No, we have some, he, he'll have his opportunity. Yeah.
The uh, next witness is the gentlelady from Florida, uh, Karen Thurman. Mr. Quinn will, be, will be testifying after she does. Ms. Thurman, please uh, proceed. Mr. Chairman, I thank you all. This amendment that we're offering um, is to reduce or is in the area of salary officers and employees appropriations by about $2.9 million. Um, these funds were intended for equipment and software purchases for various administrative offices of the House. However, if you look at the uh, Appropriations Legislative Subcommittee in its report, they stated that, yes, while the equipment purchases and upgrades to existing systems are sometimes necessary, however, it is essential that appropriate review be made of the justification of potential costs and savings associated with these acquisitions and their appropriate author authorization be acquired. The Director of Non-Legislative and Financial Services, as de facto Budget officer assured in the future that review and authorization of equipment items is, is given prior to including these items in budget request, basically saying that they had not given the, the best evidence that this was necessary. So what we're asking is that this 2.9 um, actually be cut from this area. Okay. Um, do you have any further testimony on this point? Yeah, I just, and I'll right. leave it with you. Uh, Mr. Solomon. Ms. Thurman, you uh, certainly are entitled to offer your amendment. Uh, we hope we can make it in order, and uh, I think you would win it on the floor. Thank you, Mr. Solomon. I appreciate that. Mr. Quillen? Well, uh, you have a question, you've been very patient. Well. Waiting. Well, I thank you. And um, patience also is an education in this committee, and I've learned a lot just sitting here listening. So, actually, I kind of appreciate this time. Okay. Mr. Goss? Karen, thank you very much. A good amendment. Did you uh, have a chance to run any of this by the committee before? Mr. Goss, yes, I did. I have talked to both the House Administrations Committee and I also talked to the Legislative Appropriations, and I think they both agree with it. Okay, good. Thank you very much. Thanks. Mr. Derrick, do you have any questions? I have no questions. Thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, the next witness is uh, Jack Quinn. Pleased to uh, have Mr. Quinn testify. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'd like to revisit for a minute, probably briefly, the uh, frank discussion. Um, and thanks for the opportunity to testify today on behalf of an amendment that I'd like to offer, along with my colleague from North Dakota, Mr. Pomeroy, to H.R. 4454. Um, each year, Mr. Chairman, the Congress spends lots of money. We've talked about this when Mr. Blute and Mr. Castle were just here on the frank. Communications, of course, is, is most important with our constituents, and um, this amendment is simple and straightforward, not quite as complicated or as in detail as Mr. Blute and Mr. Castle. <laughs> My amendment simply strikes $4 million from the official mail account, Mr. Chairman. Briefly, the history, as we know it, in 1993, <coughs> the House spent $24 million on frank mail. For 1994, the current estimate is about $41.5 million. The Committee on Appropriations has recommended $35 million for 1995. This amendment would reduce it to $31 million, uh, straightforward. Um, I think that this is a step, modest step in the right direction. I believe that other members will and should support it. And it's an opportunity, I think, for the American people to see that we can cut spending in our own operations in our own house while we pursue other areas. It's an opportunity to lead by example. And I appreciate the opportunity uh, to appear and to, uh, without objection, give you the written testimony. I, if I may, just briefly, in reaction to Mr. Blute and Mr. Castle, because we've talked about this for the past year, many of us have, and there are many bills present. Um, I think, Mr. Frost, as you said earlier, when I was here uh, listening and being educated, and the discussion was with the LSOs, that you as a member or any member still has the freedom to decide whether to participate or not to participate. And I think that my view, while I personally, um, for example, only spend half the franc, we only do one newsletter, we don't do any unsolicited mail six months before an election, which was a month ago, I have chosen to do that myself. And I think members, depending on where they're from and what their district is like, will choose to do whatever they think is right. That's the way it ought to be, I think, for a start. This $4 million cut is uh, a step in the right direction. And while I will do other things personally as a member and uh, don't want to be critical of Mr. Blute or Mr. Castle, I think it's a, it's a first step to, get, to begin in this appropriations bill. Well, I would only, again, Mr. Quinn, ask you the same question that I asked uh, 
The others, uh, the committee has recommended uh, increasing the other two accounts that affect members, uh, clerk hire and official expenses. The committee has already recommended a cut in the franc. Now, are you suggesting or, or would you favor cutting the uh, two accounts that have been increased for members also, the clerk hire and the official allowances? This amendment only talks to the Well, franc. I understand, but I mean, are, are, do you think we ought to be cutting those other accounts well, too since they've been increased? Well, I... I Again, I think individually members need to look at what they need. We, Mr. Uh, Solomon has just pointed out that his district is much different than a district like Mike Castle's, for example, and mine is different than somebody else's. And I think we need to make those decisions themselves. Today, no, I'm not prepared to suggest any further cuts. Okay. Mr. Solomon? Well, Jack, I just wanted to commend you ever since you came here uh, a little less than two years ago. You've been a very valuable member uh, with some great ideas. And, of course, this one is fiscally responsible. and. Uh, we hope we can make the amendment in order. Thank appreciate you. Your I'd appreciate it. Mr. Derrick? I have no question. Uh, Mr. Quillen? Yes. Chairman, I have no question. Thank you. Jack, you did a good job. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Mr. Goss? Thank you, Jack. Uh, if, uh, if I told you that the increases that were going into the um, office allowance for the clerk hire could be funneled into the, um, the mail account, uh, what would you say? Well, that, that I think would upset everybody, and I think that that's what we don't want to see happen. I think my interest here today is to make this as uncomplicated as we can and, and hope that we'll see it made in order and to get a vote on this as a start. Well, I think Chairman Frost has made a very good point that we're getting a recommendation from the committee that raises up uh, some monies which uh, become fungible, as it turns out, uh, going into the mail account, but you can't take monies out of the mail account and make it fungible the other way. So it's a one-way fungibility, uh, and it's a little bit deceptive. And I think the Chairman Frost is right to point it out to us. Sure. And as a, as a freshman member of the House and not a member of this committee, I'll leave this to the committee members. <laughs> Thank you very Thank much you, for Mr. your Chairman. testimony. Uh, the next witness is uh, Bernie Sanders, our colleague from the state of Vermont. Of Vermont. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, this amendment uh, is being brought forth uh, as a result of the expenditures associated recently uh, with the death and the burial of uh, President Nixon. And in my state, uh, I received uh, some mail on the issue where people were amazed at the amount of government money that ended up being spent, not just for Mr. Nixon, of course, but for any president. And that's what we deal with in this amendment. It's a simple and straightforward amendment that provides that in the event of the death of a former president of the United States, the day of mourning for the legislative branch shall be observed on a Saturday or a Sunday. And the purpose of this amendment is to ensure that such days of mourning are observed as is fitting and appropriate, but that they do not result in additional costs to the federal budget. The leaders of the Congress were right to designate a day for us to honor the public service and accomplishments of former President Nixon when he died last month. And of course, that's, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> that's true of any president. But in my view, it was not right to declare it a de facto federal holiday for all legislative employees. In other words, we closed down the government. And in addition to that, of course, the post offices were closed. And I am not quite sure what the total cost of the government was. My local paper estimated that it was $300 million. In other words, we brought down the entire government at a time of a $4 trillion national debt, at a time when children in America are hungry, at a time we don't have the opportunity to take care of the homeless, we spent some $300 million in order to honor and bury the president. And my own guess would be that our living former presidents right now, as well as Mr. Nixon, probably would have objected to that huge amount of money. We can honor former presidents. They must be honored. They must be respected. But in a time of fiscal crisis, I don't believe it is necessary to spend up to $300 million for that purpose. I, I would suspect that if you had them here today, they might very well uh, agree with us. Um, obviously, we are not here legislating today uh, for the post office, for other branches of government, just for our own uh, expenditures. Uh, the estimate, I believe, uh, the best estimate that I have heard is that f closing down the federal bureaucracy in Washington cost about $60 million. But my hope is that by approving this amendment and getting this amendment passed, and we are also sending a letter to the President of the United States on this, we can start the ball rolling, which says, let us not close down government in order to honor a uh, deceased president. So it's uh, 
fiscally conservative amendment, and I know my friend from New York State and other Republicans will be excited about saving the government some money, so we would look uh, and support from all members of the committee. <laughs> if I understand correctly what you're suggesting, Mr. Sanders, it would be, have the effect <clears throat> that in many instances the National Day of Mourning would not be on the day of the funeral of that particular person, but would be the next weekend uh, right. after the person's death. That's correct. Okay. Uh, Mr. Solomon? <clears throat> Since the gentleman mentioned my name and my state. <laughs> as a neighbor, Mr. Solomon, as a neighbor. My district is almost the identical shape of, uh, of his, uh, his state um, and runs parallel to it. Um, you know, there are three words that describe uh, Americanism. Those three words, that, to me anyway, and to my family, are pride and patriotism and compassion. And, you know, I just question whether or not uh, your newspaper was anywhere near correct when they say it costs $300 million. Let me finish first. Yeah. Uh, you know, when you have a snowstorm and there is a close down of a school, uh, there's a snow day there. Right. And discounting whether they have school aid, which they have to make up or something, uh, it does not create an additional cost to the school district. They paid the salary, sure, the teachers and the administrators, um, but there was not an additional cost. I, I really question whether there was a $60 million cost to the federal government within the beltway here or a $300 million cost nationwide. Uh, if the, um, it was the post office actually shut down? I don't, I didn't rec yes, recall it was. that. But uh, even if it were, uh, I don't think it created that kind of an additional cost. I think that uh, if, uh, if you have anyone who's been a president of the United States, you know, I think we have to show compassion to them, to him and their family. And I, 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 just, I, I just have to beg to differ with you on your, on your amendment. Jerry, if I might. Um, I, I know it's, it's offered in good intention. No, it is. And, and let me just uh, pick up on a point that you made. During the ice storms last winter, the, <clears throat> the Office of Personnel Management estimated that it cost approximately $60 million per day to close down the federal bureaucracy in Washington. That's where we got that figure. And a 1982 study by the House Post Office and Civil Service Subcommittee on Human Resources put the cost of a one-day closing off ordered by President Reagan during a budget crisis between 82 and 86 million. That's just for the bureaucracy here. So I think those numbers are probably accurate. And when you're closing down the United States Post Office, now again, the issue is not lack of compassion, it's certainly not a partisan issue. The question is you have children who are hungry, you have people who are sleeping out on the street. Can we honor a deceased president respectfully and with dignity, as I think we must, without closing down the entire government and spending what I believe is hundreds of millions of dollars. That's the issue. Your, your, your point is well taken. Appreciate you coming for us. Uh, no, Mr. Oh, Mr. Derrick. I just want to say that I commend you for your amendment, and uh, I don't see why they can't have the funeral on the same day as the, uh, the the day of mourning, and that can't be on a weekend. And and, and I agree with you. It's it's no lack of respect. Uh, but I, I think in a, in effect, what it is is a respect for the taxpayers of the country. Thank you, Mr. Derek. My my point on the funeral was that some religious faiths require a funeral to be held within a certain period of time, and it couldn't be delayed till the weekend. So you would, in fact, uh, in some instances, have. Uh, the National Day of Mourning and the funeral on a different day. Mm -hmm. That, oh, that doesn't mean that his, uh, his right. amendment doesn't have merit. Sir, sure, I understand. Mr. Quillen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I hope you're not singling out former president. No, no, absolutely not. Of, of course not. No, of course not. No, it, it just it came to mind because of Nixon's recent death, but this would apply, of course, to all presidents. I remember back when uh, the <clears throat> man on the moon President Kennedy declared a national holiday and everything was closed. I remember other holidays that didn't involve the former president's death. <coughs> and really, I don't think it costs that much money because they either catch up, they don't have to have any overtime to overcome what they did. And I think it's a matter of principle, a matter of sympathy, and a matter of uh, pride. and. Uh, the system that we have. I'm not being critical to you. You can be critical, it's all right. No, I'm not. Anyway, we can save money, fine, but I think there are other ways to do it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
Mr. Goss. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd be very interested uh, to see the calculations of how it costs $300 million, but even so, that means we made a profit of $700 million because everybody knows that each day the government is in session, we go $1 billion further into debt. So by having a president die, tragically, uh, it, it ends up that we cut the deficit that day uh, somewhat. Uh, and I don't want to quite look at that kind of a passing in those kind of cold statistical numbers, because that's the kind of nonsense you can do mm. uh, with statistical numbers. Well, are you uh, suggesting that the numbers that I've offered are not accurate? No, I'm saying the statistics are not relevant. Well, uh, I would think that several hundred million dollars, now we can argue about what it is, but we have evidence that when you close down Washington, D.C. and the government, you're talking about 60 or 80 million. When you're closing down the entire postal system, you're talking about several hundred million dollars. What I get a little bit upset about is when some of us say we need money to feed hungry children, people say, oh, there's just no money available. Let's do something about homelessness. No money available. This is not being disrespectful, please understand that, of any president, certainly not partisan. But we're suggesting if, in fact, it is true that we're spending $300 million to honor a deceased president, I think that is I don't think these presidents would want us to do that. To uh, I'd, I'd like to see what the direct expenditures were, and I seriously doubt they're accurate, and I will be very happy to have you provide me that well, information. Well, if you put it on the floor of the House, I promise you I will do that. The, the, the other side of it is I, I feel that uh, this is a very personal thing and, and, and maybe a little bit, you know, patriotic uh, fervor involved here. I remember very well the day that President Kennedy was shot, and I cannot think that the government could have continued to operate that day. In fact, it stopped of its own accord. Uh, and, and what you get into here is you're, you're going to have a double day of mourning. You're going to have that kind of natural reaction of uh, American citizens out there, and then you're going to have another day of observation. So you're going to end up doubling the cost if you follow this. I think we've got a very good system in this country right now of not trying to manage people's behavior on this. And I think that the family needs to be uh, given a whole lot of attention to this, too. Because I think the day of observation and how the funeral is handled, as uh, Chairman uh, Marty Frost, uh, when he was chairman, was saying, was uh, very important. There are different religions. There are different points of view on this. And I'm darned if I want to legislate it. But well, I certainly will defend it. your right to put it on the you floor. You are legislating it. That's the point. We are legislating it night, right now by spending several hundred million dollars in closing down the government. That's called legislation. I, I think it's just simply a question of priorities. And again, once again, please, this is not any disrespect to any president. I think they deserve all the honor that we can bestow upon them. Okay, that's an executive order question, not a legislative well, question. Well, we can do it legislatively, and that will have an impact. Well, I think now on... you're trying to override the president's nope. right to judge this as our commander-in-chief. Well, and that's another issue that I have a quarrel with you on. Well, I, I think we're being a little bit selective. I hear on the floor of the House once in a while some members trying to outthink the president present a different point of view. I believe very strongly in the separation of powers. We have our job, which is legislation and oversight, and the president has his job, which is administration and execution. And we all agree that there is an interplay between the two, and we don't want it to get out of balance. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do you want copies of the... Uh, uh, I think uh, Porter may want a half a dozen copies. I, I really would like to see how you got to 300 million. I'm serious about that. Put it on the floor and we'll document it even better. All right, please. Yeah, one, two, Vernon. Two points well taken. Thank you, Vernon. All right. Yeah, thanks. Who's next? Daisy? Dave Camp and the Honorable Dick Zimmer. Thank you. Dick, you're on the private list. Nope. <laughs> you're not on any list, but they tell me you want to testify. I appreciate your you're tolerance. You're on the backup list. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I have a statement I'd like to uh, submit for the record, and I'll paraphrase it and say that in the last two Congresses, I've introduced legislation, and uh, Congressman Zimmer has co-sponsored it, which would allow members of Congress to return any unspent office funds to the U.S. Treasury to be used for deficit reduction. What this would do would allow members of Congress to send a clear message to the American people that we've heard their call for, re for reducing spending and reducing the size of government. 
This legislation now has over 70 co-sponsors, both Democrat and Republican. And we have an opportunity with the Legislative Branch Appropriations Bill to adopt this as an amendment. Uh, this uh, amendment will not change current budgeting practices of the congressional offices. This will not require that any congressional office uh, spend less. It would be up to the discretion of each member. And as uh, that information became available, we think would be a great incentive uh, for members to run their offices more efficiently and more competitively. Uh, this would not increase the actual uh, authorization or appropriation level for congressional offices, uh, but would simply uh, allow members who wanted to uh, to reduce any to uh, take any unspent funds and send them uh, to the Treasury. Uh, I think this would reward frugality and reward uh, doing what every employer across America has had to do in the last few years, which is to make do with less and provide an incentive and also achieve an admirable goal of uh, attempting to get at our deficit. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I've now, uh, in three years, uh, returned uh, annually more than 100, or not returned, but not spent uh, more than $100,000 a year of, of the allowance uh, to which I've been entitled. Uh, I wish I could have returned it uh, to the Treasury to reduce the deficit. When my constituents learn that the, mo the money that isn't spent actually can be reprogrammed and spent on other priorities, they ask me occasionally, what's the point? I think that this, this amendment would allow us to link our frugality to the bottom line and to the interests of the taxpayers directly and would create an incentive, both personally and politically, for us to be as frugal as possible because we would know that the money that we did not spend would redound to reducing the deficit rather than to go for uh, whatever uh, other uh, reprogrammed uh, priority there is. Uh, so uh, I think that, uh, that we could be talking about a substantial amount of money that could be saved if every member saved in the vicinity of $100,000. Uh, but whether or not you support across the board cuts, whether or not you believe that you or your colleagues should be spending $100,000 less than they're currently entitled. I think that this legislation, this amendment is quite um, appropriate because for those members who do choose not to spend the money, uh, there's a more appropriate use for it, which namely to reduce the deficit. Derek? No, I, I was just going to simply say that I, in the overall picture, it probably isn't going to amount to much, but it certainly would be a very good thing symbolically. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Solomon. <coughs> it's a little more than symbolic. Um, in the 16 years I've been here, I've always tried to return at least 10% of my clerk hire uh, back to the, uh, uh, to the Treasury, I thought, too. And uh, then in recent years, it uh, turned out that we weren't doing that at all. The money was, could simply be reprogrammed. Did the same thing when I uh, made the mistake of returning a pay raise. And I wrote a check for 17 consecutive months <laughs> to uh, back to the Treasury, found out that money was being reprogrammed. And here uh, I had five children. I had four in college at that particular year. <laughs> and you needless, you needless to say, I was a You should have with one of them. <laughs> You're right. But uh, it's, a, it's a, a very good amendment. The thing that really has bothered me is that you've been reading in roll call in some of the local publications that um, the House administration or the leadership is thinking about freezing uh, our clerk hires as we are currently using it as of this minute. Now, I had a chief of staff retire back in January 1st. I think he was making 80 plus thousand dollars. And I wanted to see if I could get along without that position. So I redistributed the responsibilities, and I have operated without an A, without a chief of staff for now for almost six months. And it's been a real hardship. And then all of a sudden, I find out that I'm going to have my clerk hire frozen at about $70,000 below those that are spending at the maximum. Well, needless, you can imagine what, uh, what I said when I found that out. I think that's been discarded. You gentlemen aren't hearing that, I don't believe, anymore. And that if there are cutbacks, as are proposed in this, this bill, um, uh, it's going to be 
uh, fair and even among members, which is the way it should be. Uh, but your amendment is a great amendment. It should have been enacted many months ago or years ago, and uh, we'll try and make it an order for you. I'd love to, yes. Mr. Derrick, uh, I just don't want to let the opportunity go by. <laughs> you know, uh, sometimes he who tooteth his horn too, too much, mm -hmm. and uh, I would not mention this, although I'm proud of all the many accomplishments of Mr. Solomon, but I've given money back for 20 years, and I have never taken a pay raise until after an election under the Madison Amendment and written checks back to the, uh, uh, to the thing. I just happen not to holler about it all the time. Mm -hmm. I, know, Jim, I, I know a person in the chamber that uh, told his constituents that if the pay raise went through, he wouldn't take it. And he says, not only did I not get any good press for it, everybody thought I was lying. So, I mean, <laughs> he said, I didn't get any good out of it. <laughs> But actually, when you talk about not taking, as we spoke earlier this morning, this committee was one, is probably the only committee that hasn't asked for an increase in uh, 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 payroll. payroll for the last uh, four years. And then when the committee came to cut, they cut us just like everybody else. And, and you know, we thought there should have been a baseline because we just held it down. Our employees didn't get pay raises, didn't get the colas, didn't get what they want because we just held it down. But, no uh, good deed goes unpunished. That's right, mm -hmm. exactly. So uh, I know what you're saying, but uh, uh, but maybe if a person uh, just shows it on his own record uh, and takes oath of office that that's true, maybe people will stop believing him. Mr. Goss, I'm sure you've got something to add to this <laughs> great conversation. Well, Mr. Chairman, I, not much, actually. You've said it so well. Um, the, the official mail cost issue is an interesting one. We, we uh, didn't use all our, our franc one year, and I said, I'd like to return that. What do you do with the surplus? And it, I was told there is no surplus. I said, what do you mean there's no surplus? And I was told by House Administration in the most remarkable piece of mail I got in my first year here that said, we don't budget the full amount for the members franking. We just pay the bill. Consequently, there is no surplus. Now, it's pretty hard, therefore, to have an incentive to cut the franc back because the theory is, well, they're just going to pay the bill whatever you use or you're not. So there is no savings incentive there at all. So I think that would improve the situation very dramatically. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate your giving us the opportunity to testify today. And, you know, being freshmen, it hardly seems like time has come again that we're here for the second time, but that's the case with this amendment. So, Mr. Torx and I return again to ask that you allow our amendment dealing with franking disclosure. And our amendment is quite simple. It merely expands on the improved franking disclosure practices that were established in the fiscal year 1991 Legislative Branch Appropriations Bill. Language in that bill directed the United States Postal Service to report all franking expenditures on a monthly basis to the House. These monthly reports provided to each of our offices are kept confidential and are not available to the public. All that is reported to the public is a quarterly, unitemized total of money spent. But where current disclosure practices are most inadequate is in the area of timeliness. The quarterly report of the clerk is usually issued some three months after the close of the reported quarter. In election year, that means that money spent by a member in July, August, and September, just before the election, is not made public until December or January after the election. The alternative to waiting for the quarterly report is to file a Freedom of Information Act that any individual has the right to do, but we believe that the Congress has a responsibility to provide that information itself. The National Taxpayers Union agreed with us last year and endorsed our amendment. In 1990, this Congress wisely created a detailed method for the accounting and reporting of all taxpayer money spent on franked mail. In 1994, we hope that you will give the members a chance to take the next step toward meaningful reform and allow us the opportunity to pass our amendment to make that information readily available to the public. We, just, we don't want to change the procedures, just let the public see that information. I mean, how would you allow the public to see this information? 
if they, you know, these reports that we get monthly would be available to the public. If they requested a copy, then it would be available. I, I do that as an individual. I mean, we can now do that. If someone wants mine, I let them see it. I don't send but one mass mailing a year. I returned 72 percent of my franking budget last year. You what? Returned 72 percent of my franking budget last year because we only did, you know, one newsletter. But, you know, anyone that wants to see it should be allowed to, you know, the monthly report should be public information, and that's all we want to do. It wouldn't change the report. It just says the public doesn't have to go through the long process of a Freedom of Information Act. The public can still get it. You just require them to go through a two or three month process. Right. We're mm -hmm. saying let them get it quicker. You know, if they want it, we the Congress are saying sure. When you want to see it, you can see it. Peter Torkelson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's a pleasure to testify again before your committee, uh, Jerry Solomon and Board Goss. Um, just quickly to, to reiterate what, what Congresswoman Fowler has said, we're not asking for any new paperwork to be created. We're just asking to release the paperwork that's already compiled uh, that is in existence. We just think it should be available on a monthly basis. Instead of having uh, everyone have to wait for the quarterly reports to come out, usually two quarters after the fact, this would just give people a, a timely uh, uh, basis to find out who is spending how much money, how quickly on franking. So we're, we're just asking for a very simple and direct disclosure requirement there. Uh, and if I may, I'd like to speak on two amendments uh, proposed separately from, from Mrs. Fowler, but uh, two that I think are important. Uh, the first one that I, I'd like to, to mention is to reduce the 10.2 million appropriation for the Botanic Garden by $7 million. Your, your co-sponsor was up here and testified on that earlier. Yeah. Terrific, thank you. Uh, just for the details, uh, given uh, the tight fiscal times we're in, I think we need uh, more information on this. I understand that the, this is a, an estimated cost by the architect of the Capitol. I know there has been some private fundraising uh, being done for this, uh, as there should be, but I think that uh, all members deserve to have a, a little more information on exactly how that is happening. And again, perhaps if we, we can't afford it this year, uh, maybe in some future year, but I, I think uh, this type of cut is appropriate given fiscal circumstances right now. The Second Amendment would propose a $3 million cut uh, in the Congressional Printing at the Government uh, Printing Office. I don't know if uh, the co-sponsor on that has testified yet or not. Yes. Okay. Very good. And again, this is uh, what I believe is an attempt to cover up uh, a deficit from previous years uh, um, from uh, executive branch printing requests. I think that, uh, like every other shortfall in funding, that's going to have to be made up. I know it's painful. It's something that we all have to live with, though, and I think a, a $3 million reduction out of the total $6.8 million increase uh, is doable. Again, it won't be easy. There are a lot of, of cuts that are going to be difficult to make, but this is clearly another area where I think the taxpayers have to be told that we're looking out for their interest, that uh, we're looking at, at cutting our own expenses uh, while, while cuts have to be made in many uh, accounts across the board. And Thank so I, I hope that all three amendments would be made in order. Mr. Solomon. <clears throat> Peter, first of all, both of your amendments are good amendments, and uh, we hope we can make them in order. Uh, concerning the um, the publicizing of the um, of the members franking that's nothing but accountability uh, we do it with our financial disclosures that's available to the public uh, our payroll is available you know through the quarterly uh, clerk hire reports uh, certainly franking should be too and I think it's a great amendment I hope we can make it I appreciate you thank you very much. Mr. Goss I presume you're trying to stop election abuse of the frank is the main thrust of this is Precisely. that correct and, and we I congratulate you for that Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Thank Chairman. You. Okay, the Honorable John Miker and the Honorable Jennifer Dunn. I think okay. it's done with the right back, but if I may start, Mr. Chairman. And I do have a separate amendment other than what uh, Ms. Dunn is presenting. Uh, today, before the rules committee, uh, Put the mic on. Sorry. Today before the uh, Rules Committee, I bring a uh, very serious matter, um, and I think it deserves the attention of the full House and, and, and a vote. Mr. Dunn, you want to join Mr. Micro at the table? Are you on the same amendment? No. It, no oh, okay. Not. Thank you. Um, I serve on the House Government Operations Committee, and uh, it's, it is an interesting committee because it, it historically it dates back to uh, uh, 1814, when it was in the wisdom of the early founders of the Congress and the nation, uh, the committee was broken off from ways and means. And it, it doesn't have a legislative purpose, as you may well know. It is in, in charge of investigations and oversight, uh, an extremely important uh, responsibility. Uh, 
I'm not here today to request any additional funds. What, I, what I'm uh, looking for is really uh, a mission to restore confidence in the system. And I, I say that because I think that the very integrity of the House of Representatives is at, at stake, particularly in, in this time uh, and day when you have one party that dominates the executive branch the and both of the legislative branches. Uh, and they control the investigative and oversight uh, committee of, the, of this particular uh, committee of Congress in a very unfair uh, fashion. I also understand that the amendments that I am pre uh, presenting require a waiver of the rules, and I believe that this uh, bill is uh, both the appropriate route because it involves committee funds. And as I said, this is a, a question of real fairness uh, and also integrity of the system. The my majority and minority staff disparities really make a mockery of the entire congressional process of investigations and oversight. And I brought some charts to illustrate, if I may. Can you bring those up, please? This is the number of investigative staff uh, for the majority and for the uh, minority. In, in Government Operations Committee. If you, we've had request after request for documents, for assistance from the administration, we've gotten stonewalled. And I won't go into the long list of, of items that are pending. But how can you conduct oversight and investigations of the executive branch when the minority has nine staff? Actually, I think this is up now to 10, and that's only because I've been uh, raising so much cane on this issue from the day I came here. But how can you be fair with investigative staff of that uh, representation? And then funds, yeah. members of the uh, committee, funds are, look at how they're distributed here. The minority, uh, I'm sorry, staffing uh, is minority. Look at these percent percentages. 14.8% for the uh, major minority and 85.2% for the majority. Then let's look at the funds. The 94 uh, expenditures that are proposed, the Democrats get $2.175 million, 83% of the funds. The Republicans get 17% of the funds, $594,000. Now, I, I say that this is grossly unfair in this circumstances, and my amendment does uh, divide up on, on the basis of representation in the House, which I think is very fair. The House has voted twice to grant the minority one-third investigative staff uh, or funds, and this has never been met. The Senate has granted the minority at least a third of committee staff since 1977. Then my other amendment deals with the, alter the only alternative I see, and, and uh, I'm hesitant to uh, propose it, but I'm very uh, uh, sincere when I do propose it. The uh, other amendment says abolish the committee. If we can't have some fairness, if we are going to conduct real uh, investigations and real oversight on a fair and equitable basis, then I think we have no alternative to abolish the committee and turn this money back to the taxpayers. So that's the, uh, the proposal that I bring before you today. Uh, two alternatives, uh, and I hope that we have an opportunity to debate these on the floor. Mr. Goss. Thank you. I, it's impossible to legis legislate fairness. Um, you can try and do it set by example, but I understand your frustration. Um, the question I want to ask you is, did you testify before the Committee on Reorganization on this? I've testified. Bef uh, my comments are part of their report. I've testified before uh, the Appropriations uh, Committee uh, or House Administration Committee. Uh, I've brought this matter to the floor on repeated occasions, and I'll continue to pursue this matter until there's some fairness and equity. Thank you very much. I have nothing okay. further. I hope we can make it in order. Thank you. Uh, we've only got two minutes left to vote, Porter. Have you voted yet? I have, sir. Oh, I haven't. So uh, I, I wish I could s s squeeze you in in two minutes, but I don't think so, can I? Okay. Uh, thank you. We'll be in recess of college the chair. You're watching coverage from Wednesday's hearing before the House Rules Committee on appropriations for the legislative branch for fiscal year 1995. 
The Rules Committee decides guidelines on how a bill is debated on the House floor and what amendments are introduced. Members are considering a $1.9 billion bill for overall congressional operations, including the Library of Congress. We'll continue with the hearing in just a moment, but first a few program notes. This week on Book Notes, our guest is Pete Hamill, former editor-in-chief of the New York Post. He joins us to discuss his recent book, A Drinking Life. Book Notes can be seen each Sunday on C-SPAN at 8 p.m. Eastern Time and again at 8 Pacific. And later this morning, around 10 o'clock Eastern Time, we plan live coverage of a hearing on deficit reduction held by the Joint Economic Committee. Testifying before the committee, economist James Galbraith. That's later this morning, around 10 o'clock Eastern Time, here on C-SPAN 2. We now return to the second part of this hearing of the House Rules Committee as members work on a legislative branch spending bill for fiscal year 1995. The Rules Committee decides the guidelines on how debate is conducted in the House. Legislative appropriations deal with money to be spent to run the House of Representatives, including members' expense accounts. The chair of the committee is Democrat Joseph Moakley of Massachusetts. This part of the program runs about 10 minutes. The Rules Committee will resume, and we're very honored to have the Honorable Jennifer Dunn before our committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and it's an honor to be here. Thank you for letting me come and talk to you today. Regarding the Legislative Branch Appropriations Bill, first, I, I would like to take a, a moment to comment on an amendment that was uh, presented here earlier by Congressman Tom Manton, who is the chairman of the subcommittee on which I I am the ranking Republican police and personnel on House administration. His amendment based on H.R. 4227, which he and I introduced, would raise the mandatory retirement age of the Capitol Hill police officers from 50 to 55. Uh, this change makes our retirement age regulation comparable to that governing other federal police officers. And so as ranking member of the Police and Personnel Subcommittee, I strongly urge the members of the Rules Committee to approve that amendment that Mr. Manton presented to you earlier. Mm -hmm. Next, Mr. Chairman, I urge the committee to make in order two amendments that I've been supporting as a member of the House Administration Committee and as a member of the Joint Committee on the Organization of Congress. The First Amendment simply reduces the amount of the funding of the Investigative Committee staff by 4%. Uh, that would take it from $53,191,000 to $51,063,360. The House is currently grappling with a full-time employee reduction requirement, and my amendment would help solve this problem for the House with a minimum of disruption, simply the cutting back of the investigative committee staff. The Joint Committee has also called for a reduction, and so my amendment really pushes us further in the direction set by both the Legislative Branch Subcommittee and the Joint Committee on the Organization of Congress. Uh, that amendment that I've uh, provided you also includes a minority protection clause that the members of the minority or the ranking minority member would be able to control one-third of the budget of that committee. Mr. Chairman, it's important to note that this is only a 2% reduction of total committee funding. For 1995, it would be. My second amendment is a limited version of the one I've just told you about. It simply accepts the funding levels approved begrudgingly and asks that the minority be given a one-third share of the investigative staffing. I would like to see that under their control. Mr. Chairman, in 1989, it was Congressman Coelho, who was then Majority Whip, who pledged to bring minority staff ratios in line with the minority representation in the House of Representatives. That was five years ago. At that time, in 1989, Republicans controlled about 17 percent of the staffing of committees on the investigative side. We have moved, at least uh, January 1, 1994, to 21 and a half percent. But under that trend, it would take us until the year 2006 to get to 33 and a third percent control. And so I believe now is the time to alleviate this disparity and uh, t to treat the minority as, as we know you would wish to be treated. Thank you very much, Ms. Dunn. Mr. Solomon. <laughs> Congresswoman Dunn, let me just uh, heap praise on you for your tenacity and uh, in, in your persistence, really, in pursuing congressional reform. You are a member of the Congressional Task Force 
uh, appointed by the Speaker uh, to try to reform this House, and uh, certainly uh, you're following through here again today uh, in that effort. Uh, the amendments are excellent amendments. Uh, you certainly should be heard. We have to remember that uh, the because of the way that the uh, our system is set up, there is no authorizing bill. In other words, we have a, an, a, a legislative appropriation bill, but we don't have the opportunity to legislate because there is no authorization bill. Uh, only that would come out of uh, the committee you serve on, the House administration, occasionally, maybe every five years. Uh, but on a yearly basis, you and I and others don't have a chance to offer legislation such as this. So that is why you are entitled to your waivers, uh, and we hope we can make your amendments in order. Thank you so much for the good you, work Mr. you do. Solomon. Also, Ms. Dunn, I think if you check, if we're not mistaken, I think this committee comes as close to that two-third, one-third as any committee in the Congress. You know? It does, and uh, Joe Moakley has been extremely fair. Uh, uh, not only has he, uh, uh, along with myself, gone before your committee and asked not to have our uh, uh, budget raised, budget raised, but uh, uh, he has always treated us almost fairly, uh, very, very, very close. <laughs> <laughs> and I know, and you've been held up as a good example, and certainly I think you felt your share of cuts, too, along the way, despite a, an excellent performance. In fact, in the last four years, we didn't even ask for an increase. We were the only committee rare. in the Congress. I but know. yet, when it came time for cutting, they didn't use our past history as any barometer. They cut no, us, too. you got more than your fair, <laughs> fair right. share of cuts. Thank you very much, Mr. Thank Goss. You. Thank you. I just have a point of clarification about one of the statements uh, I thought I heard you say, and maybe I got it wrong. Uh, I think when Mr. Mantle was before us, he s was talking about the mandatory retirement age capital police officers going from 55 to 57. Did I hear him wrong, or did I hear you wrong, or did I just hear wrong? Uh, my understanding of the amendment is from age 50 to 55, but I'll double check oh, my numbers. I, I, I think it's an interesting subject to debate, but I'd like to know what the numbers are. You bet. We'll maybe get my sheet you. is wrong here. We'll get them to you right away. Is, an, is there a national average on uh, police retirees? I know that uh, I think that uh, most policemen do retire at 55, don't they? That's my understanding. No, that was mine, too. So I'm a little puzzled, but we'll get it sorted out. And why we're unusual, but we'll let you know for sure. Uh, on the other question, uh, Jennifer, I happen to agree that, you know, the way you're going on the one-third breakdown is great, but I would rather see it go on a true proportional basis. Uh, you know, the Republicans are not non-people, uh, and if the Democrats were the minority, they would not be non-people. Uh, and I got to think we've got to remember that we've got uh, a representational proportion here that is not in any way reflected. Uh, and one of the debates, one of the problems here we're going to having with this particular piece of legislation is that it is a reflection on management. And the management here is 100 percent controlled by the majority party. And when there is unhappiness, there is defensiveness by the majority party to try and justify what often cannot be justified. And that is part of our problem. Now, I say that present company accepted because I also agree with our ranking member that Chairman Oakley does an extraordinary job of taking the work of this committee and the way this committee operates and handling it fairly when we all very well know that this committee is designed to be the handmaiden of the Speaker's office for the management of flow of legislation. Uh, we understand that. Uh, and there have been a lot of commentary about whether it serves its purpose uh, one way uh, or another. And maybe that should be a study of your committee as well, and I understand it is. But I have no complaints uh, with the way Chairman Oakley runs this business. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Goss. And Thank I would just say that we, too, would like to reach toward the 41 percent that we really represent in, mm. on the floor of the Congress now. And we believe that if we staffed at that level, and that would be a long-term goal because we're nowhere near the one-third that we're asking for now, but there would be a set of staff who could provide us with fresh ways to solve problems. I think that's what we're missing right now. Mm -hmm. So I would urge the chairman and the committee to, to grant that this amendment be debated on the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you. The uh, committee will stand in recess, subject to the call of the chair. Uh, members will be given a uh, uh, half an hour yes. before we uh, come back in a session for the uh, voting on the roll.